Tonight's episode of the Tuesday Night Cigar Club is brought to you by Drew Estate. Come experience the rebirth of cigars at www.drewestate.com and download the free Drew Diplomat smartphone app today to discover nearby retailers, RSVP to special events, redeem points to win exclusive Drew Estate merchandise, and much, much more. Sisters of the Leaf, coming to you live once again from, well, all over the fucking place, it's the Tuesday Night Cigar Club. Tonight, the boys congregate once again via live video to find the answer to the age-old question, where do baby dinosaurs come from? As they talk their way through the 1994 cult classic, Tammy and the T-Rex, while smoking the NBK Lizard King Cigar from Blackwork Studio, paired with a plethora of tasty beers. It sounds like we're in store for one hell of a good time, folks. So sit back, light them up, and enjoy the show. Oh, and you do know where baby dinosaurs come from, don't you? That's right, Tyrannosaurus sex. I'm so sorry. But anywho, it's time to start the party, you lovable numbnuts. Drink one for me. Before the cameras start rolling, I need to tell you guys about something that happened today. Uh, I was at go through my notes real quick. I was at the grocery store. Both me and a ninety-year-old man reached for a pa- uh, the last roll of paper towels on the shelf at the same time. I wouldn't let go. He wouldn't let go. I tried to talk some sense into him. So eventually, I just started pounding him repeatedly in the face, just wailing on the dude. Then. Another elderly grocery store worker tried to pry me off that guy, and I ended up body slamming that old bag of bones to the ground. It was like some sad, twisted, extremely bloody geriatric steel cage match, and I just mopped the floors with one crusty old bastard after another. I mean, it was like, it was fucking crazy. (laughs) We're we're recording. Everybody can hear you. Oh, we're rolling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can't really get, you're going to have to take a mask off. Can't really hear you mumbling through there, but it's probably a good thing. Oh, so we were on, but nobody could really understand what I was saying. Uh, well, yeah. Well, good. I was just, hello everybody. I was just telling the, the fellows a story about me helping a nice elderly gentleman with his groceries at the store this morning. I, I was thought we weren't rolling, so because I'm not looking for praise, as you guys can attest, I'm a I'm pretty humble, gracious man. Um, then um, why why are your knuckles all red? Welcome everybody to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club, episode 114, coming at you live. <laughs> as in, we're still alive somehow and doing well, sort of uh hey everybody oh doing better now hey guys uh yeah you know i really goofed tonight uh you know we're, these are strange times i we're not used to we're recording the show on a friday night and friday night's my tex-mex night and i'm driving home with my thing of uh coronitas and i'm that sipping, what they're calling them uh, that's what i'm calling them <laughs> uh, copy trademark Tuesday Night Cigar Club two uh, two thousand. Isn't that the Drew Estate little the Coronitas? Yeah, but this was the Q. Quarant the quarantine. Oh, quarantine. Yeah, Quarantinas. 
I got to work on it. Anyway, and then I remembered as I finished my my second quarantina, as on I drive s- home, as I settled in here to the corner of Hope. Oh, I'm drinking Imperial Stouts tonight. That's going to be an interesting mix. <laughs> Uh, you were like Ron Burgundy in the telephone booth. It was a wrong choice. <laughs> Internet beer experts. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. That should be fun. How are you guys holding up? Everything uh, since our last show? Everybody doing all right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you looking stressed? Yeah, coming into the last two weeks of school. Oh, that's right. Got uh, finals just around the corner. Some have already started. Uh, well, it looks like you're holding up well as you grimace in pain and, and rub your temples. Uh, hey, but the good news is, ever since we started doing these, these, these video conferencing episodes, your plant is growing. You said it would. That thing is really sprouted. That's pretty. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, look at that. Uh, very nice. Very nice. Very nice. I haven't killed it yet. The last time I'm going to mention that plant, by the way. I feel stupid for even bringing it sorry we can cut that out in post no way just wait till the other leaf blooms uh i cannot wait uh doctor you missing for something wait till the other leaf blooms <laughs> doctor you doing okay uh thank you for asking sir i am uh doing as well as can be expected uh all is well over here at casa doctor uh managed to go out and walk uh nine holes yesterday so uh they reopened the golf courses with certain restrictions that seem to make sense. Um, yeah, I got no complaints. Uh, it's great to see you guys. Now, I forget, Doctor, are you actually in your office now, or is that your, your domicile? This is my domicile, yes. Okay. okay. I, I have not uh, been working uh, in the office since, believe it or not, March the 13th, which was a Friday. Wow. I am, uh, yeah, doing everything I can from here. Making the occasional house call, of course. Of course, of course. And uh, Yak Boy, uh, O'Brien's Irish Pub in historic downtown Temple, Texas, is still closed uh, with with really no no concrete end in sight. So you're just you're just hanging, huh? Still closed, but still standing. You're there now. We are not going down. We are not. Does my voice sound really high and whiny to you guys tonight? It always sounds like that. What do you mean tonight? Oh, I always sound like this. I was going to help you out and say not in the least bit, but uh, I put the mask back on. Hey, Cody, uh, stand up a little bit. Let me see that beautiful egg shin shirt you got on there. Oh, there we go. Six demon bag. Nice. That's Give that's me cool. hope. Love it. I love that's, it. All, that's all you've got on, isn't it? <laughs> um, no. Why Don't feel just... bad. Superman's son does the same thing. Yeah. Well, hey, did you guys hear this? Uh, a bunch of, say a bunch, two or three studies have come out. You know, everybody's working their ass off trying to figure out this situation we're all in. And one major study conducted in France, so you know it's both smart and fancy. And sexy. And sexy. Doctor, would you say the sexiest medical studies come out of France? I think that's inarguable. I agree. They have shown po- really solidly uh, lead- clues leading that tobacco users are less likely to contract the coronavirus for some reason. They, they have some link to nicotine. And for once, we're kind of ahead of the game here, boys. Tobacco, you say? Yeah. Hmm. You said they have the sexiest reports. We didn't say the most accurate. (laughs) Yeah, it's all all healthy and shit. They smell of Galois and red wine, but they aren't always (laughs) always accurate. The French would only release a study saying that heavy, you know, very questionable drinking habits also kept it at bay. We'd we'd be indestructible. So what you're telling me is that I'm invincible. I think we're getting there. No, Cody, even the slightest little cough could be... Invincible. Speaking of drinking way too much, am I the only one that's gotten like really self-conscious every other Monday morning when my recycling bin gets dumped at the <laughs> flatter herd two miles away of all my bottles being dumped into the, the truck? Like, 
It it's true. That was in the uh, the Stephen King book on writing. He said when he realized he had an alcohol problem was in the early 1980s. The state of Maine enacted a, a returnable bottle and can law, and so he said he went out on a Thursday night to put some beer cans into this recycling bin, and it was just filled to the top with beer cans. He was like, he said it was empty on Monday. It was like, hmm, my wife don't drink. I've got three kids. They, they're all underage. These are all mine. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> it, it, it wakes up several neighborhoods when they dump. It sounds like church bells. It's a <laughs> very, very beautiful church bell. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Well, boys. Hey, Cody. Uh, what do we do here every episode on the Tuesday Night Cigar Club podcast for over five years now? Well, we like to take three things and just mash them all together. Mash no, no, we have an all try and hopefully to have a delicious premium cigar. Hopefully, hopefully, followed by with a delicious premium craft beer, yeah, which yeah. hopefully will be good which I've already had sampled mine, which it is very good. And while we do those, have imbibe and, and smoke those two, we tr discuss a hopefully cinematic jewel. A gem. A, a gem. Rough cinematic gem. And then we bring the story to you at home in our own unique way that's what we do sometimes it's a cinematic zirconium but we do what we can uh and and yax i don't ask you to to recap what we do here on the show for our our listeners if they may be new sometimes i actually need you just to remind me to kind of i i forget what we're doing here in the first place um uh, well tonight is no different ladies and germs uh we're gonna smoke a cigar and i'm gonna tell you about it it is the NBK Lizard King from Blackworks Studio. It is a 5x50 box pressed Robusto Barber Pole cigar. The wrappers, because it's a barber pole, that means, as you can see here on the screen, it's got two different wrapper leaves to create a barber pole spiraling effect. Rappers are Ecuadorian Maduro and an Ecuadorian Rojizo, uh, which that Rojizo. one's Rojizo. That one's new to me. It is the lighter red of the two wrappers. Um, the binder is Nicaraguan Habano, and the filler leaves are all from Nicaragua. I will wait till later to talk about price point. Um, yeah, Ted, Ted, did you ever heard of a Ecuadorian Rojizo? Tobacco? Rojizo, no. That's the uh, the lighter the lighter reddish wrapper leaf. Okay. Oh, that, that one's a new one to me. Um, way back in 2016, on episode 25, we interviewed Blackworks uh, main man James Brown on the show as we reviewed the original NBK blend. Uh, the original was and still is a six by forty six box press uh, featuring an Ecuadorian Habano wrapper. That has a real, it had a real nice spice when we first lit it up, and then it kind of downshifted into medium territory uh, with some nice cocoa on the retro hail, rich cedar, leather on the draw were the dominant notes. We liked it so much. Remember this, boys. We went to TJ's Cigar Lounge in historic downtown McGregor, Texas, mm -hmm. and watched a blending seminar about how the NBK was, was made. We got to sample the individual uh, tobaccos. Todd, I believe that was the first time you had your Ometepe fix. Uh, it's not Ometepe. I was a fiend for the Lajero, just a straight up boom. Esteli okay. Lajero. I want yeah. something that punches me. Okay. Um, and yes, that was that was one of my favorite blending ceremonies because uh, that was the first time where you actually kind of could, you know, you hear like all these other aficionados, a.k.a. Skip, which, you know, he's been around the block. He knows a thing or two. It's, I don't even taste, you know, blackberry sauce or whatever. I just, I just taste Esteli Lajero. I just taste Oma Tepe. And then that was the first time where I'm like, holy crap, you actually can 
after that seminar, I could pick out those flavors. Uh, yeah, it was really good. And uh, anyway, we ended up smoking a lot of NBKs over the rest of the year. I still smoke uh, whenever I get my hands on a few NBK. It's it's one of my favorite from Black Label or Black Works. Uh, I agree. And we gave it our number two, ranked it our number two cigar of 2016. That's high praise coming from internet cigar experts like ourselves. Um, so that's a little bit of background. Tonight's cigar is an amped up variation of that blend that's available only Ooh. it's available only at black works events where you go to the brick and mortar tobacco shop they have the sales rep there and you buy a box you get the lizard king you know it's an event only stick but now that we're in end of days territory here the rules have kind of changed a lot of brick and mortars have been given lizard kings to sell outright or to do their own kind of uh, online events to move cigars out the door or whatever, which is a good thing for everybody. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't sure if we're going to be able to get our hands on these this year. And thanks to Tut's buddies over at Smoker's Abbey in Cedar Park, Texas, they quickly adjusted to this pandemic and popped up an online store. I've done a really good job of, showing through Instagram and social media what they've got on the shelves. You go on the website, order it. They had to work, Tut. You called them when you were there and they brought it out to the car? Or? No, they've just, they've, uh, you order it on the, uh, on the line and then they package it up and they sit it right next to the door. You just walk in there, pick it up and go. Uh, I like that. Easy breezy. Don't have to talk to nobody. Don't have to face no trouble. Just, Boom, it's got your name on it. Normally when, when there's a guy looking at you going, Yeah, that's him. When we're not in social distancing, do you do you like talking to those guys at Smokers Abbey or Oh yeah, yeah. No. They're they're not only are they knowledgeable, but they're pretty dang friendly. Okay. Because the way you said it, you sounded really happy that you didn't have to talk to those guys. I'm happy when I don't have to talk to you guys. <laughs> Ouch. Oh. Todd, I find that hurtful. I'm sorry. I didn't mean you, doctor. All right, then it's okay. I know, I know who you meant. <laughs> he didn't mean you either, yet. <laughs> Figured. Uh, so that takes care of the cigar, which will uh, light up here momentarily. Uh, I'm getting um, really a classic kind of barnyard uh, aroma off the wrapper itself, and then off the foot, I'm getting some cocoa notes. Yeah, it's pretty with that uh, that barber pole. And when I picked it up for uh, pictures a little earlier today, that thing was oily as all get out. It well, was really, slick. Yeah, got a really nice sheen to it. Uh, just oh man, it's a, it's a good looking barber pole. And on the you can tell it's got the the usual NBK. If you're watching here on the screen, I'll hold it up. It's got the NBK logo on the front of the band, but then it's got a new artwork uh, designating the Lizard King. It's got kind of like a well, hell, it looks kind of like a T-Rex on the back of that thing. What? Uh, doesn't it? <laughs> sort of. Um, no, I think, I think it kind of does. It kind of does. How about that? So before we um, get too much further, Yak Boy, we also drink a lot of beers. And usually where we all drink the same beer at the same table, uh, we can't do that anymore. So we're all drinking different beers. And why don't you tell us about them? Okie dokie. <clears throat> Tonight, I'm having the perfect disguise. Double IPA. It's from uh, Dogfish Head uh, Brewing out of uh, Delaware. Uh, they've been uh, brewing since uh, 1995, making their wonderful, delicious beers, which this one is very good, by the way. Perfect Disguise uh, gets its name because they say it looks like a Kolsch, but it is an American-style IPA. So it looks really light, but it has a little bit of a kick to it. So uh, I'm getting a lot of, you know, floral, citrus. I'm liking it. What are the IBUs? Only about halfway through, so we'll see how it goes. Is it a high IBU? Or? Uh, the, it's a uh, 8%. Uh, ABV and they clock it in at around uh, 70 IBUs. 
I'm going to say it's it's got a, a, a fair amount on the, the bitterness, but I'm going to I'm going to hold off judgment just yet to see if it, it if it hangs in there. If that's just my palate. OK, uh, boy, it's got a really nice initial. Uh, little uh, Boom, that little pepper and stuff just coming right on out there. On the nose, really kind of wasabi hangs up there at the top of your nose and, and burns nice. Really good aroma. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, what am I drinking, Yax? You are drinking the Outer Darkness Darkness Russian Imperial Stout from Squatters Brewing. They're out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, the 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 Outer Darkness. It's uh, it's a little bit of a kick. It's ten and a half uh, percent uh, ABV. And 65 IBUs. Utah. So, throw it away. Get rid of it. <laughs> it's Mitt Romney's favorite imperial stout. <laughs> Who took I heard that? that. I heard that. Is Who that took, a selling point? Who Tuck kind of looks like now with that hair. Uh, a favorite beer of Donny Osmond. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't normally go for stouts, let alone Russian Imperial stouts. Uh, the reason I did, when I was looking back at our, our first round with the NBK, if you remember, that was our old Rasputin uh -huh. Imperial stout. Wasn't that Imperial stout? Yes, yes. it is. Um, and I didn't listen to that show because I remember we got all fucked up and like, <laughs> at the end of it, we were like pushing each other around and like things got really dark and ugly. Um, but I remember it worked really well with the NBK. So I was like, you know what? I've been drinking nothing but IPAs here lately. Uh, I'm going to try an Imperial Stout and Tut's going to be so damn proud. I am. Good on you. And it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Can't get out of the IPA wheelhouse. Luckily they, they only sell them in four packs. So I only got four of these fucking things to drink. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's got a really, it actually, it's, it's, as I get towards the bottom of my first class, it's gotten better. Uh, <laughs> it has, uh, it does have some really rich chocolate notes to it, which are nice. That's good. Um, it doesn't have too big of the coffee presence. Um, but uh, it, it's not bad, but you know, it's, it's getting pretty warm here in central Texas and, uh, a, a, a rich, dark, heavy Russian Imperial Stout. Doesn't go good with the 90 degree day? On top of several Coronitas. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But you know what? I can tell already it is going to work just fine with the cigar. Hey, what? what's Tut drinking? Tut is drinking from Left Hand Brewing Death Before Disco. That is all. How does that tie into the nice movie? <laughs> it doesn't. The uh, uh, Death Before Disco, it's a uh, 6% ABV, 24 IBUs, 24. 24. What is it? What kind of beer? It's a porter. A porter. Oh, excuse me, porter. Uh, it is a, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. I was looking at yours. Yours is a stout. Never mind. Uh, it has uh, notes of uh, rich chocolate malt and dark berry notes. You and delivers. Oh, okay. Yes, delivers it. You getting berry notes? Mm hmm. Hidden softly in behind that layer of dark tar chocolate and nice roasted malt. That's what. I, that's why I picked it up. I saw that dry roast malt, and I'm like, that's what I want tonight. Real quick before you get to the, <laughs> before you get to the uh, doctor's beer, I'm pretty sure he did it just to piss me off. And this is the kind of the point we're at in the relationship. You know, when like a band's been together for about five years and certain members start just doing things on stage to kind of just get on the other guy's nerves. They're just trying. Oh, <laughs> kind of like when uh, Glenn Fry told the other dude, I'm going to fucking kill you. A little more subtle. Dig, oh, okay. dig in that. Um, Tut posted this thing on Facebook about how lower ABV, darker beers with 
with no hops are making a resurgence and how he's so excited about these these wussy dark beers coming out. I'm like, he just posts that shit to piss me off. Like, give me a break. Actually, this is going to sound strange, but you were even not in my thoughts at all. This sounds like something you're imposing on this. God, yeah, because it's Vince Neil and Tommy Lee all over again. we got to figure out a way to make peace between these two guys. Hey, look, I have a few things in common with Tommy Lee. I'm not really comfortable talking about those on the show. You both uh, drink a lot? I only have one Heroin thing. Heroin addiction? Yes. Oh, we both have hepatitis. <laughs> oh, okay. No, big wings, big wings. Mm. Uh, I guess we don't really have anything in common now that I think about it. Uh, well, I, I just don't like dark beers very much, and and I, I, I'm going to give this one a shot though. I bought it. I'm going to I'm going to drink it. I think actually it's going to that it probably will surprise you and play nice with this cigar because that that nice spicy retro hell that's just kind of hanging on is floating over the top of the uh, malt and the chocolate presence. So if your imperial stout's delivering on that, then I guarantee you it's it's a nice jive between those two. It actually is because that maltiness is kind of leaving me a little tingle on the back of my tongue, and then I'm getting the tingle through the nose. It, it, it's working well together. Yeah. Right? Uh, beer scientists, Tut, that's what we are. None better. What in the world is the doctor drinking tonight, Yak Boy? Add gum it. Yeah, I love that. Dad, dad gum IPA. Dad gum. Rar and Sons out of Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Yeah. No, it's actually really good. Go on. Uh, uh, the, it is, uh, Rar and Sons started back in 2004 uh, by uh, uh, Fritz and Aaron Rar. I've been there to the brewery. It is, it's, it's quite nice. It's enjoyable. They're huge. Uh, the the Dadgum IPA, it's a six and a half ABV and 70 IBUs. Also be 70, just like my beer. Doctor, are you enjoying it? I am very much so. Uh, in fact, I'm about to grab another. Uh, I would, however, uh, on the can itself, it says, charged with citra and lemon drop hops, lively bitterness, Intense notes of fresh cut pine and tropical fruit. Now, all of that really sounds terrible to me. Um, but quite honestly, this is a very this is a very tasty beer. Um, now, if I if I put my nose in here like I'm like a wine glass, I'll admit that you pick up pine, which is a little bit disconcerting because pine to me is pine salt. But that's what IPAs are, buddy. I, I don't I don't really pick up. I guess, I mean, I don't, I don't really taste, you know, citra and lemon drops makes me think so I'm going to get something kind of fruity out of it, fruity tasting. I don't really get that. Um, I'm not as good at judging uh, the IBUs as you guys are. 70 almost seems like it's a little bit high. This is a yeah. very good beer. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. I really like it. It's very, it seems very smooth. It doesn't, when it says lively bitterness on the can, uh, I don't know about that. It, it's it's a really nice tasting IPA. I wouldn't say it's lively or intense in its bitterness, which is good for me. If you see 70 IBUs on a can, you should probably count on about low 50s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they Everyone jacks that number out, and it's ridiculous. I'm yeah. taking that from Yax's uh, research, but I think I, I looked it up myself. It, do, it actually doesn't. It just it has the, the, the alcohol volume 6.6 .6 on the can which is primarily why I chose it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it doesn't list the IBU. I've had some, I've had, a, as, as Yax told us, it is a Fort Worth company. It's about 45 minutes down the road from me here in Flower Mound. So I've had some other Rar and Sons, but I have not had the Dad Gum IPA. It is very enjoyable. I would recommend it. Yeah, they're a good brewery. I like them. Speaking of recommend, recommending things, uh, boy, the first inch of this cigar, uh, that spice is not, in the original MBK, like I mentioned, that spice kind of dials down after, or th th that spice is hanging in there on this one. Yeah, uh, it's, it's large and in charge. It's not going away. I'm still getting that cocoa and leather on the draw. Uh, a little more uh, cocoa and earthiness, actually. Yeah. 
than leather, but I, I am getting a little bit of leather. But yeah, it's really earthy, spicy, uh, with just a that that little bit of chocolate. Um, man, it's really good. You like it, Ted? Yeah, I I I got everything that you said, and then I'll throw in some peanuts, like a little bitty hint of a peanut. But I think that's coming off of the beer. Uh, got some peanut in your beer, huh? Yeah, it's on the retro hill, like the very back part of the retro hill. Okay. Yaks, you just let up. You enjoy? I am. I'll agree with you on that spice. Getting a little bit of sweetness. I don't know if that's coming from my beer at this moment. So I'll have to see how, it, as it progresses, if that remains. That's it a- might be from the beer, like I said, but um, I do like that. I like the spice. I, you know, little, uh, Got got a good hint of leather as well. I'm enjoying it so far. That's a dad gum good cigar. I'll go ahead and say that. It is a dad gum good cigar, dad gum. It, it was a dad gum. Dad gum. Oh, by the way, my movie tie in keg was dad gum. I never should have broken up with Denise Richards. Uh, <laughs> I forgot that you two dated. So did she. <laughs> More on that later. Speaking of Denise Richards, our third... Right, first of all, for the gullible one. Did you? It was Dennis Richards, and oh. it was it's a long story. It, it was Denise, and it was a short story. <laughs> uh, God, what an idiot the doctor must have been to break up with her. What a fool. All the teaser boys, we, we tease it to make oh. people watching, and we'll get, we'll get back to the doctor and Denise Richards... Dennis Richards later. We'll get back to you and Dennis Richards some other time. Uh, well, Denise Richards. Oh, Dennis. <laughs> Denise, uh, Denise Richards is stars in tonight's film. Uh, every episode, we take you through a film. And boy, tonight's one is, is unique. 1994's Tammy and the T-Rex. Can I, set, can I do a little setup real quick? Not sure. for the story, but just for my own personal stuff. Sure. So knowing the caliber of movies that we like to do here, I'm like, or Cade's like, hey, we're doing Tammy and the T-Rex. And I look up and I'm like, ooh, that's Denise Richards. There is a high probability that there's going to be some boobies in here because that's what we do. We watch movies with boobies. Denise Richards plus boobies. I am ready to go. Roll it. You kind of have to throw all expectations out the window with this thing um whatever you think this movie is literally you 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 can't uh walk into this thing and have it figured out before it before it starts um this film has quite an interesting history i don't believe we featured anything remotely similar to it before in the podcast when it was released on home video back in 1994 tammy and the t-rex had a pg-13 rating attached to it and it was presented and marketed more as a sort of oddball teenage love story by the misguided studio heads but it was originally conceived and filmed as a blood-soaked rated r gore fest so skip ahead what 20 something years this newly unearthed gore cut of the film was released last year by the outstanding home video distributor vinegar syndrome and is now available after a a very successful festival run to view in all its bloody glory on your TV screens and tablets at home. How cool is that? This was basically a a kind of goofball teenage love story that didn't have any kind of ultra violence in it. And then they went back and were like, oh shit, look at all this other stuff that was filmed. Oh yeah, we made a whole different movie and boom, here it is. I was trying to think, Doctor, of another film that kind of has this completely different life down the road than what when it was originally released, and I couldn't do it. I mean, you've got like Halloween 6, the producer's cut, which is kind of among horror fans, this legendary thing, but it's still basically like the theatrical cut, uh, Michael Myers' heavy slasher flick. I mean, it's not a, a different genre altogether. I mean... It's this is kind of a, a really crazy thing, right? It is, and yeah, was, I think it TVMA was the rating for the gore cut that we watched. And believe it or not, as I was talking to Kate about it, I know we we all remember um, 
back in the late 90s on the USA channel, late on Saturday nights, the lovely Rhonda Shear would host a show called USA Up All Night. Up All Night. Uh, that's where I first saw it uh, still edited for television, even though they were on at midnight. That's where I first saw loose screws, loose um, screws, loose screws, breaking away. So I actually caught the party scene from Tammy and the T-Rex on USA up all night back when I was in college. And I thought, Oh, this looks great. And I went out and actually purchased a VHS tape of it. But what I got was me and two other people in the United States. And but what I got was the PG thirteen cut that Cade referred to. This this hadn't been out there. So no, it, it's 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 extraordinary to think that uh, by just re-editing, uh, just not even re-editing. I mean, just including some lost footage. It's it's totally different from so many of these horror movies that Cade and I have seen, where there's a director's cut and it's two minutes of extra gore that yeah. they just, it really doesn't add anything to the narrative. It doesn't change the overall theme of the film. It's just, we had to cut this out because in one of, I can think of is, is a final Friday with Jason uh, part nine. And it basically, I watched it and it's literally like 90 seconds. And it's just because they just stay on the blood a little bit more. It doesn't change anything. Yeah, they, great point. This is a totally different movie. I mean, this is basically if, like, Can't Buy Me Love, if there was a subplot where Ronnie was going around killing chicks at night, like he was a serial killer, <laughs> and he was, like, butchering people to get to Sandy, Cindy Mancini and, like, dancing under the moonlight in their skin. Like, that, that's kind of what this is. God, I want to see that movie. I'm pretty sure there is a gore cut of Pretty in Pink out there where Ducky is going and killing everybody. I told you. Please, don't do I that. Know. Tut, why did you encourage him? I told you something wasn't right about him, Mandy. I told you. You wouldn't listen. <laughs> Let's go back to your original idea. What the movie's been called, Can't Kill Me, Love? Eh? Mm -hmm. Directed by Stuart Raffle, who... You have a name. Directed two of Cody's Yak Boy's favorite movies, 1988's Mac and Me and 1991's Mannequin 2 on the Move, which was the superior mannequin movie, by the way. Mm. And wait for it. We have featured one of his films before on the podcast. Oh. 1984's The Ice Pirates. Oh, oh. that's right. That's right. That's right. Episode 99, we talked about Stuart Raffles, The Ice Pirates. And get this, boys, it gets even more weird. His co-writer on tonight's film, Gary Brockett, played Percy the Robot in The Ice ice Robots. The nice. little C-3PO guy walking that, around? Yeah. He helped write tonight's movie. That's nice, nice. Nice, you know, Brockett. This podcast has become so unintentionally incestuous after... 114 episodes like different writers and directors and i mean we just kind of keep circling around this weird cinematic mass of shit i mean uh gold it's I mean, gold it, 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 such information of course just sheds you know more light upon this film how would someone make this film what would they have had to do before this oh ice pirates yeah okay this makes sense perfectly why do you think you should get to make this film, Stuart? Oh, I don't know. A little thing called Mannequin 2 on the move. Let me show you my screenplay for Mannequin 3, Electric Boogaloo. I think we'll find out who's stupid. Right. <laughs> You're hired. Um, but yeah, so this we, we've kind of dealt with these people before, and uh, I, I can't wait to talk to you. Before we do, uh, let me just wet my whistle here. My throat's getting a little bit dry from this dark, dry beer <laughs> lean into the stout lean into it i am look at that ash you always got to worry about barber poles because you're dealing with two different wrappers if you're going to get you know what kind of any kind of construction issues or a clunky ash or a weak ash it's holding together great a simple clip on the head of the cigar great draw i'm sorry man i keep feeling like 
someday Yaks and I are going to have to sit you two down like that, that Leif Garrett episode of Behind the Music, you know, or Tuts in a wheelchair and the two of you are just like together and we like got them together and you're like, you're like, I'm sorry, Tut, I'm sorry. He's like, no, man, you saved my life. It's not your fault, man. It's not your fault, man. I we, like those dark beers. Me and Tut are cool. As far as I'm concerned, I, I think he's got some issues. <laughs> and why is he in a wheelchair? I don't know. Just throwing out there from the behind the music. I just Ted Gov is IPA is good. Is Tut's video frozen, or is he just really, really thinking about things? <laughs> oh, I think I think his video is frozen. Yeah, I think he's frozen. I was like, man, maybe there's something. Maybe there's the something. wheelchair thing. You remember the you remember that behind the music episode? Oh, dude, who could forget? It was it just ripped your heartstrings out if you cared about any of those people, which I. <laughs> which I, I never did um but yeah t- uh, you man this cigar is really working for me you yeah boy i'm liking it i like the spice uh it's a, it's mellowed out a little bit here to, uh, getting towards the halfway point but all in all i'm i'm digging it yes yeah, actually uh i'm trying to smoke it a little bit slower uh I, Right about the end of the first third, that spice is kind of toning down a little bit on the nose, um, which I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I was kind of really enjoying it, so we'll uh, we'll see. Um, well, folks, as we um, navigate our way through the new way of podcasting um, post COVID nineteen, um, occasionally we're gonna maybe lose a member temporarily, not like dying. I, I think Tut just had some technical difficulties, so he'll be back when he can. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the film if that's okay with you boys. And hey, until he's back, feel free, to, feel free to say any shit you want to about Tut. Uh, I got some stories. And 30 seconds ago, me and Tut are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. You guys want some? You guys want to say some shit? Now's your chance. <laughs> he doesn't go back and watch the episodes. I'll leave it in there. Whatever you want to say. It's got both male and female sex organs. <laughs> You're a doctor. That's science. Denise Richards. Dennis Richards. <laughs> we start. <laughs> we start Tammy and the T T Rex off with a title card that reads Tanny and the Teenage T-Rex, which makes no sense at all. But what I thought I read, Tranny and the Teenage T-Rex made even less sense. Yeah, that, that's what confused me because it's one of those where I'm like, you know, trying to get all set to watch this and, oh, okay, wait, what? Yeah, the, the title card, I had to rewind it. The, the title card said Tanny. And the, like, how do you fuck up the title cards of a movie? Uh, well, I'm assuming that was the name that they gave to the PG-13. Why else would you put in like Teenage T-Rex? Yeah, no, I, I think that was Tammy too. I, I think it was just a, a kind of jacked up title card, which even the Tuesday Night Cigar Club manages to get our title cards right, for God's sake. And Like, look, we gave Buck Flower the tower the title card machine for two hours. This is what happened. I can do it. I can figure this out. I've been in pictures for 25 years. You're incapable hands, sugar tits. Uh, okay. But yeah, for God's sakes, you made ice pirates. We just gave him a giant bag of money. What else can he mess up? When, when Charles Brockett is making a movie, you should give you let Brockett have his leeway. The guy made Ice Pirates. We thought he could handle the title cards. Uh, man. Yeah, in, a, hey, in 114 episodes, we've never had anybody fuck up the title cards before. Uh, but, don't have title cards. But it, but it was, like I said, I, I had to rewind it because I thought it said Tranny and the Teenage T-Rex, which <laughs> I had to stop and be like, God, how many cuts of this movie did they do? Like, what's this shit about? <laughs> Which is know. Denise Richards in that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Dennis Richards. 
That's Dennis Richards. It that was Hutton Eye's reactions. Tranny in the tall right. It doesn't matter, boys, because we then cut to a high school cheerleading practice with a top-heavy Denise Richards gyrating around the gym floor, and suddenly, I don't give a fuck what they call this movie. I'm okay. I'm happy. Unless, I guess, a big dick popped out of her cheerleading shirt. <laughs> and then I, I probably wouldn't rewind the scene quite as many times as I did. I'd still rewind it a few times, but not quite as, quite as many. Maybe. I don't know. Definitely. Doctor, you also get the rock and theme music you so desperately wanted in Samurai Cop here. You get a really great dinosaur theme song. Feel the rumble, feel the roar, dance to the music of the dinosaur. Dance to the music of the dinosaur. I'm a prehistoric man, a dinosaur dude. I'm king of the jungle and I'm coming at you. Coming at you. It's good. It's a good opening tune. <laughs> I immediately shot uh, Kate a text, and I was like, oh, dude, Doctor's got to be here for this show. This is his stuff. And I, I thought Dawkin had trouble getting work there. <laughs> uh, it was very Dawkin-esque. Uh, a young Paul Walker, playing the character of Michael, enters the gym straight from football practice to watch the pick he's got a crush on, Tammy, played by the, as mentioned, top-heavy Denise Richards, finish her routine. They exchange a harmless peck on the cheek and he walks her to her next class. Man, Paul Walker is so fucking wet behind the ears here. I'm sorry, he was never a great actor. It's the truth. It's true. But it's obvious that he's just as happy as a kid in a fucking candy store to be in a movie here. Like, he just seems like, I'm in a movie. Like, he just seems... Was it his first film? He's about With Denise Richards. Funny. Yeah, and he's... With Denise fucking Richards. Yeah, I think I think that would have a permanent smile on well, my face. Too. But I'll say I'll say this: while his performance in this film is amateurish, it is it, it all it is it's endearing too. I I agree. I agree. Uh, he he does come across as as likable and um and he did get better. I'm not saying he was a bad actor by any means, but I mean you know he wasn't. I, I never saw. Hey, him we're yet. not going to pour out a boot, but hey, I'm going to take a sip to the late Paul. Any other, any other takers on that? Not even going to have a sip for the guy? No, said, all right. One sip. Just take a sip. Also because I was thirsty. All right. One sip. I, I faked that. I, I didn't sip. No, okay. I'll take him a sip. Come on. As Steve Carell said on an episode of The Office, the only cue for the Monday blues is varsity blues. So I take a drink for Paul Walker. Hey, you can't you like, have a drink for the guy? You like that Tokyo Drift movie. And he wasn't in it. Oh, is he not in that one? <laughs> I never, no, I never. Take a sip of your beer for him. We're not doing a booting. Just take a sip of your beer for the late Paul Walker. I never saw any good of run, time. Paul. It Actually, good. it wasn't. You were gone Cut way before your time. Oh, you know what he was pretty good in? Was that, uh, did you guys ever see Running Scared? Yeah, I actually did. Yeah. Hey, they're real creepy pedophiles. Uh, that's the only thing that really stuck out in him. But, but, but he was he was okay. He was he no was a, it's like you said, he's not a bad actor. He just wasn't a great actor. He was serious. There's, there's lots of people out there like that. There were. There were. Well, after a brief run-in with Tammy's best uh, friend. There you go, Paul. There you go. Jeez. Do it without the attitude. And don't <laughs> do it at all. <laughs> Somebody's going to get visited by the ghost of Paul Walker tonight. Which, well, that, that makes sense. I'm already getting visited by the ghost of James Franco. <coughs> He's not, I mean, dead, is he? Oh, shit. <laughs> Tut killed him earlier. It's like, who was that guy in my bedroom last night? <laughs> <laughs> who yeah. was that guy in your bedroom? It was sure, James Franco. You sure smelled like James Franco. <laughs> After a brief run-in with uh, Bi Tammy's best friend Byron, a flamboyantly gay African-American classmate, who also happens to be the sheriff's son, Tammy returns the flower and bracelet that Michael slipped into her book bag earlier that day. She tells him she can't accept it because she's still with her abusive dickhead boyfriend, Billy. And boom, just like that, guess who pulls up in their convertible muscle car? Abusive dickhead boyfriend, Billy. That's right, Ted. And did y'all recognize his sidekick, Weasel? 
Yes. Of course. Actor Sean Whalen, who gloriously played who, Tut? I don't know. You said you, of course, you recognized him. I've recognized him, but I don't know what he's in. I thought he was in American Werewolf in London. Uh, no, he was not. Uh, he was in a movie we featured here on the show. He was Roach, the guy who lived in the walls of people under the stairs. Tried to raise my hand and get that in there. But I... Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. He was the one guy I didn't recognize in this movie. Well, you were dropping me all these texts like, I recognize this guy, I recognize... So I thought I'd give you a shot here. And, <laughs> and you outed me on the first one. Yeah, I did. Of course we knew who he was. All right, who was he? I don't know. <laughs> Which is funny because I told you that I watched uh, Escape from L.A. this afternoon that had A.J. Langer in it, so that was two people under the stairs things in less than 48 hours. Uh, boy, these little cinematic '90s, especially the '90s genre films, they're just the same actors just float in and out of all of them. So within seconds, Billy and Michael are brawling, and it is—and this took me a while to be comfortable saying this—it is the best high school fight I've ever seen in the history of motion pictures. They're doing swooping leg drops, twirling each other, <laughs> twirling each other around, and flinging each other into the crowd clotheslines, flying elbow drops. At one point, Billy performs the RKO finishing move on Michael. And right as the cops show up, Billy grabs Michael's nards super hard. And Byron from the crowd, the, the gay guy, exclaims, oh no, a ball twist. As Michael screams in pain, Billy taunts him, what are you going to do now, dickless? To which Michael grabs Billy's balls and starts twisting them. It's a double dick twist. You ever seen one of those, Doctor? Uh, man, not uh, not in recent years. A double dick twist is pretty serious <laughs> business. I mean, okay. that's the uh, Doctor. Do you think either of these young men would be able to achieve erections again anytime soon, or is there are their balls pretty much useless going forward? But I, I'm just gonna say that uh, you know, with youth on their side, I'm afraid it's far too early to tell. I agree with the doctor. Thank you, doctor. It goes on and on. Because there's somebody else in this movie that he's dating. Both dudes groaning in pain and they won't release the other guy's ball sack. You let go. No. So Deputy Norville, played by the one and only Buck fucking Flower, looks at his partner and tells him what they're witnessing is one of those classic testicular standoffs. <laughs> You always hear about these things, but you never get to see one. I haven't seen one of these since 67. Uh, Buck Flower, of course, uh, big time uh, John Carpenter regular. Uh, but we, God, I, we had to have had him on the show here before. Um, uh, they here. Live? Did, did we ever do They Live? We never did They Live. Oh, wow. That seems yeah. like we have. Oh, we did. <laughs> uh, God, he, what did we do? Something because I, I remember waking up the next morning, my throat was all sore. From oh, I remember we talked. We talked all night about Buck. Yeah, I, I, it escapes me right now. I, I bet it was a titty movie, uh, like a bikini car wash or something, where he was like the the uncle yeah. loaded him some cash or something. Um, well, anywho, I'll have to look that up on a on a station break. They finally count to three. The deputies and both men reluctantly let the other one's gonads go. But while Billy is on his knees, crippled in pain, Michael starts laughing. Get this, he was wearing an athletic cup the whole time. Which, how could Billy not know that if he was scrunching his nose? <laughs> you would think. As Billy's hauled off by the cops shouting, he's going to kill Michael. He says at least 20 times, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you till you're dead. He already had a restraining order against him from the school, so they're have no hesitation taking him away uh doctor style hey <laughs> i don't know why that that was a glitch yeah i'd like to see how that got into your notes that was a glitch yeah i'll give you a glitch uh michael tries to talk with tammy but she runs away this is exactly the type of high drama she didn't want she cares too much about michael to see him hurt by billy and we've seen billy in action he's a hothead but He's a high school hothead, you know. I, I don't. At this point, you don't think 
when the high school punk says he's going to kill you, that he's actually going to kill you. But we'll see. Uh, yeah, after talking like Buck Flowers, I need another sip of mine. <laughs> my beer. Uh, we then cut to a warehouse where an enormous animatronic Tyrannosaurus Rex is being unveiled. A mad scientist, Dr. Walkenstein, played by Terry Kaiser. Of- Walkenstein. Is it Walkenstein? <laughs> God, who's, who's this guy from? Where have we seen this guy before? We get at Bernie's. He's Bernie from Weekend at Bernie's. He's also doctor. And uh, the obviously unethical uh, psychiatrist from Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood. This is his, uh, his second foray into unethical doctoring, which I know, Doctor, you are very against. I am against unethical doctoring. What's funny is when I was playing golf with my dad yesterday, he was like, man, I saw this really bad. And my dad likes horror movies. I saw this really shitty movie on, on the other night. And I was like, which one? Oh, it was one of them sequels. It was, it was Friday the 13th, part seven. I said, oh, that's a good one. He was like, what, the, the chick with the telekinesis? I was like, yeah, it was good. He's like, I fucking sucked. <laughs> hey, everyone thought it sucked because it was different. But uh, over time, it's one of my favorites. I, I love Bart Seven. And, and Terry Kaiser, famous for playing a corpse. Yeah. I mean, that's his most famous role is just, I mean, Paul Walker could have played that. And it, ouch, ouch. And it gave Bill oh, Simpson. No, 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 no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't mean because he's dead. <laughs> I meant, I meant because he. He could have just closed his eyes and and and. That is, I, I didn't think about the fact that he's actually dead. That's what I was thinking was it was just kind of cruel. <laughs> You're right. It's it, it, it's not. It, it's it's ill formed to speak that way of the deceased. And I apologize. By the way, weekend at Bernie's gave when Bill Simmons used to write for ESPN.com. He would use that reference often to a head football coach that looked like they were completely lifeless on the sidelines. You call him a Bernie. Yeah. I think he called it the Art Shell rule. If you just look like you were. <laughs> Poor Art Shell. Uh, well, Dr. Walkenstein. I would have called that the Jack Party rule. A lot, of, a lot of people fell in that category. Dr. Walkenstein is ordering his nerdy minion, Bobby, played by Tut. I don't know his name, but that's uh, the dude from Children of the Corn. Isaac. John Franklin. John Franklin, the uh, child preacher Isaac from Children of the Corn. Question me, not that boy. Sorry. Well, he who drinks behind the, the rose. He who drinks What's behind the rose. He who drinks uh, behind the rose. It was, it was fun to see him pop up. I don't, you don't see him in a lot of stuff. You don't, but also what I really amazes me more than anything Probably else, because, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like, you know, how far, you know, this was in 94 and then Children of the Corn, and you're like, my God. Dude, don't age. How old is he? <laughs> and actually, he popped up in a later Children of the Corn movie, like Children of the Corn Part 16 or something. They brought him back. He still looked the same. Yeah, it was, the, it was uh, I think, called Children of the Corn 666, and it was about five years after this. Yeah, and yeah. he did still look the same. I think Stacy Keach was in that, too. He was. Not with his... Escape from L.A. Ponytail. No, no, not with, not with that hairpiece. Yeah, it's a separate one. Man, you were right, dude. 90s? Dude, you, you, 90s, it all, it all comes together. And the doctor and I have said before, if we ever start a jazz fusion band, it will be called Stacy Keach's Ponytail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Walkenstein's ordering Bobby to activate the monster's lizard eyes, and he types in his computer and the T-Rex's eyes come open. His arms! Everything is big with the with Dr. Walkerstein. His mouth! It's a very intentionally over-the-top performance by both him and Bobby. They're very, they're going big time here, uh, to say the least. Walkenstein then commands Bobby to demonstrate the T-Rex's power. So Walkenstein's henchman, Gunther, picks up a loaded barbell. He's, because he's, He's a henchman. He's got barbells laying around. Uh, he picks up a loaded barbell and hands it over to the T-Rex's tiny little hands. And Bobby makes him thrust it effortlessly at the mad doctor, which impresses him. Now, show me his teeth, 
So Gunther shoves a thick tree limb into the T-Rex's jaws and he easily chomps it in half. Dr. Walkenstein is pleased with the test results. Now the T-Rex only needs his mobility, a life beyond the walls of this boring warehouse and a stupid computer. That kind of irks the nerdy Bobby. And Dr. Walkenstein promises his creation that he will give him that freedom because he will give him a brain. And with that, Colin Clive and James Whale both did somersaults in their grave. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Walkenstein's hot girlfriend, Helga, is certainly impressed. Oh, yeah. As, Let's talk about Helga. As the, the orchestra score swells and the mad scientist... That's not the only thing. <laughs> Ain't it? Uh, the orchestra <laughs> score swells. The mad scientist cackles maniacally as unexplained theatrical smoke starts shooting. I mean, it's, a, it's a big to-do. Uh, it's all so cheesy and so much fun at this point. It is very fun, and I'm, I'm enjoying the heck out of it. So he's going to get this damn dinosaur brain. You know what doesn't take much brain power to respect that? What's that? Glad you asked, Hut. I'm talking about the craft and technique that's put into every Pappy Van Winkle family reserve barrel fermented cigar. You don't have to have a brain to appreciate what these guys are doing. It's so obvious they're doing something that's never been done before. It is a long filler premium cigar rolled in limited quantities at La Gran Fabrica Drew Estate in Esteli, Nicaragua. Deep barrel fermentation is the key process that makes this expression vastly different from anything else on the market. Hand-selected leaves from Kentucky, we've been there, are packed into small torquettes or bundles of tobacco for you noobs, which are then rolled strategically into oak bourbon barrels. We've seen that happen in Louisiana at the barn smoker. Water is then added while immense pressure is applied to the torquettes via railroad jacks. The tobacco is removed two, three times per year, shaken out, then repacked. The total process of fermentation takes 12 to 18 months, leaving a truly unique flavor profile and aroma. The Pappy Van Winkles Family Reserve Barrel Fermented is now available at brick and mortar Drew Diplomat retailers everywhere. Good deal. Speaking of cigars, boys, how's it going? I'm about a little, not quite halfway done. Oh, I am I am burning through this. I'm down the final third. Uh, man, it's just me. There's a strength picking up in this thing. Uh, well, you, well, you, well, you stepped out earlier. Uh, Yagbo and I were talking about after about the first third, that spice kind of went away for a while. Now, as I approach kind of the middle part, it's coming back. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm getting a lot of the more of the strength from the the draw of the cigar, that earthiness, and that chocolate is really i'm getting a lot more strength on the draw um i kind of wish the spice was up, ramped up even more on the nose to keep up with that yeah really that real hearty fullness on the draw but it, it's a really good smoke i was about to say the earth is really kind of pronounced in that last third it's just kind of pouring in there and right as i blew my smoke out my nose just now the spice totally ran you did what i asked it to do <laughs> it's like a t-rex i just got to talk to it and it'll give me what i want uh, Yak Boy, you liking it? I am, absolutely. You smoked a lot of MBKs. Uh, I, I think this is definitely an amped up MBK. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I'm kind of like Ted. I'm I'm already in the last third, hitting on the last third. That uh, strength is picking up. Uh, I'm still picking, you know, just the hint of hint of uh, chocolate there and leather, and I'm liking it. I'm like I like that strength. It's, yeah, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful cigar. It's one of my favorites that we've done so far this year. Uh, I'll agree with you on that. Uh, how's it? It's pairing okay with my beer. Uh, I think the maltiness and the, the chocolate on my stout is doing really well with the, the chocolate and the cigar. And like I said, the maltiness is giving me a little burn on the tongue to go with the burn. It, it, it is pairing well. I, I, I wouldn't drink this beer without a cigar. Yeah. Uh, how's it pairing with you guys? I'd actually kind of want to do it without this because the, I think the beer is interacting with the cigar a little bit too much. And it's kind of really playing with that chocolate, uh, that's going on there. No, I'd like to porter tonight. Yeah, it's a porter. Uh, 
but it's a it's a heavy chocolate with a little bit of fruit into it, Porter. Uh, and I, I think that's actually accenting that chocolate so much in this cigar. I'd actually kind of like to see what it tastes like without it. But the pairings, uh, and don't get me wrong, the pairing is really, really great. I mean, it's a great pairing. But I'd like to see what this cigar does on its own. Um, I actually, without drinking your beer, I think you might actually be fortunate because I, I think if that beer is bringing out more of the chocolate in the cigar, I, I think that's a good thing because there, there, that chocolate's there, but I wish it was more pronounced and I wish, I wish I was getting more of it. Um, so I, th- I think you might be, you might be doing all right there. What about you, Yax, with the, uh, the double IPA? This one is fantastic. Uh, like I said, they, they, you know, were trying to make it, you know, a American IPA, which I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say this one, you know, is just, I mean, like I said, 70 IBU. So it's not like, you know, a kick in the teeth in terms of bitterness or, or hop strength, but it's still really, it's really flavorful. I don't think it's clashing with the cigar at all. I mean, I think it's complimenting it, but I, I definitely will say that the sweetness that I thought was coming from the cigar is definitely coming from the beer. So yeah, there's no sweetness whatsoever in the cigar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I'm going to tell you, this is one of my favorites we've had on the show this year. Yeah. It's a really, really good job. Easily. And I'm always impressed. I like, we've said on the show before our number one of our number one cigars we had three number one cigars last year. They were all Neanderthals. One of them was the genetic deformity barber pole. And I'm always, I love barber poles. And I'm always so impressed when they construction wise, when they hold together well and they burn as if it had a uniform single wrapper leaf. Yeah. And I'm also, I'm not getting with the genetic deformity. You kind of got a, a yin and yang. Like you could tell when, when Certain, the wrapper hits, when the wrapper hits, we're having you don't get that here. I mean, granted, they're both Ecuadorian wrappers, so thin. Um, but I, a well done barber pole construction wise always gets uh appreciation from me and my respect. So, uh, I, I yeah, I'm really really enjoying this one. And by the way, it's okay to have three cigars in your number one spot, I don't care who says otherwise. <laughs> The podcast police uh, tried to bust us on that one. And uh, <laughs> if you don't like it, get your own show and talk about it. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's all water under the bridge. And uh, say anything you want about us, we don't delete our comments. Anyway, well, we don't I, know how, but you know. I mean, yeah, we'll figure out how. God, if we if we can do that, we can clean up so much issues uh somebody's gonna write, write us dudes just click on the comment and hit delete oh oh yeah <laughs> we need to get this guy on board social media it's good it's good it's good this kid's good it's my 70 year old grandma i'm She's some good. kind of a podcast expert he's good <laughs> uh doctor how's your beer treating you before we move on very good. I'm really enjoying the Dadgum IPA. I recommend well, it. Let's not get vulgar about it. I mean, it, oh, that's oh, the, it's the, the name of it. I'm sorry. The, uh, the Dadgum IPA. Dadgum. Uh, boy, Ra- Cody Rar and Sons is, is, I don't know, is it that well known outside of Texas? But in Texas, it's everywhere. I mean, it's a really pr- prominent brand. Yes. In- They've done an uh, excellent job of getting themselves out there and uh, I mean, I guess for the for the Texas craft beer scene, they were you know kind of one of the the first that really you know went outside where they started. You know, a lot of them you know they've been they they've stayed. There's there's a ton of breweries in, in the DFW area that they've just stayed there. They have not gone any further outside that the the city limits. Rar and Sons was one of the first. Uh, I actually met uh, Fritz Rar because he brought us a keg of beer when he, they were first starting. Oh, cool! Or uh, when they when they were just starting to distribute into our area, to the to the pub or to your house? <laughs> I, I wish it was to my house, but no, it was to the pub. 
I could do without the little prost, y'all. On the can. Hey, uh, his name's Fritz Rar. Yes. Rar. All right. Our our musical uh, fifth member of the group, who's uh, we can't enjoy his music right now due to the coronavirus, but. Fritz Beer, I always thought was the coolest name I'd ever heard. Fritz Rar is pretty damn cool too. Rar. Or are you just saying any name after Fritz is a good name then? Yeah. You know what? I'm going to change my name. To on Fritz our- Walkenstein? Oh, that was Excuse good. me. Walkenstein. I'm just picturing the sea captain from The Simpsons. I'll be drinking Rar and Sons. Hey, doctor, do you know, do you know where uh, pirates like to eat? No, Arby's. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, no, I'm having technical difficulties. I have to leave the. Um, I've been I've been quarantined for over two months with two young children. All my jokes are kid jokes. I'm so sorry. No, apologize to your children. <laughs> Do you know uh, what music pirates listen to when they're making love to their special lady? Ken- R. Kelly. Kenny Loggins. Uh, it didn't work. Oh, and by the way, my, my kids didn't tell me that, that R. Kelly love making joke. I just came up with I that. should hope not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Later that night, we cut to Tammy's house where the doctor's lurking up in the trees with his trusty binoculars. Hey! Oh, sorry. I don't know why. My printer is doing some really weird things. I don't know why. Sorry, doctor. I mean, I was doing it, but let's not talk about it. No, no, no. She's up in her bedroom crying. She's so torn up. She's so torn up about what happened at school earlier that she calls up Michael on her old-timey telephone. Did you see that thing? It had like the big, it was like an old Victorian telephone. It was the 90s, uh, which means she would have a 1920s telephone. Um, she calls up Michael and tells him she wants him to come over. She wants to be with him right now. She even tells him where to park so her parents won't see his car and instructs him on how to climb up to her bedroom window. and. Just like that, he pops out of bed, grabs a rubber from his nightstand, and gets the hell out of there. I'm liking this guy. I'm liking this guy. Yeah, but she gave those instructions really easily, didn't she? Like she's done it before? Here's where you're going to want to park. There's a tree that's going to provide just the right amount of cover. My parents won't see that. You're going to walk 30 meters over here along the fence line. I had the whole Winnipeg Jets... uh, scope out this thing you know it was trial and error one at a time and that's why he grabbed the rubber he's like uh yeah <laughs> I don't, I don't need this. Dude, i've heard about you it would have been great if he paused and grabbed another one <laughs> no if he didn't even have one he was like oh wait a minute yeah i better get this Unfortunately for our two lovebirds just as michael 20 seconds later is climbing up the trellis to tammy's bedroom window some shameful, vengeful party sluts who are hot for Billy happen to be driving by in their Jeep. And when they see what's going on, they see an opportunity to make waves with Billy and his gang. Hey, we should call her parents to bust her. No, no, no. Let's call Billy and start some shit. Who are these bitches? Yax. Who's doing that? Yax, am I right? These are total bitches. They are. They are bitches. Me likey. I, I like those bitches. You, you guys are hot for the bitches? Billy's got good taste. No, he's been rejecting these bitches. I'm just saying, you know, well, I mean, he rejected them for Denise Richards. That's true. But why are they still hanging around? Because apparently Billy's... Billy. He's like Matt Cade and Tommy Lee. He's got certain things that... By the way, I kept trying to figure out who Billy was. Is he anybody significant acting-wise? Yeah. Just God, he looked that. so familiar, yeah. though. He, he did. Up. He I did. Up. I looked him up. I didn't recognize anything at all. Didn't he looked really familiar, like he was going to be one of those 80s, 90s guys that would have struck a chord. And yeah, I think, just, I think I it was, was the, that feathered hair that all those those guys had back then that the doctors kind of uh, bring it back. 
quarantine style. Uh, yeah, he he did. He did have that look like I should know this guy, but I did not know that guy. No. Well, just as Michael and Tammy are starting to get it on up in the bedroom, they tell each other that they love one another first. So, you know, this is something real, boys. Billy and his crew show up. They break in the front door, blow past her dad. He's useless at the front door and barge upstairs into her bedroom where Michael's just made a hasty exit out the window. And hold hold on, Kate. Didn't the didn't the the dad also look so familiar? But he I couldn't. Place... I don't think he was anybody either. But didn't he look? I couldn't place him either. But I swore I saw him somewhere. I looked him up because I actually thought he was one of those Kennedys that tried to get into acting, one of the Kennedy cousins or something. He had a very unique look. No, he's nobody either. Yeah, you're right. I just looked it up, and I, there wasn't anything that he was in. No. I told you I wouldn't look anything up, but I had to find. I could have sworn he. I could have sworn he looked familiar. Yeah. Well, we now get one of those only in the movies chase scenes where Michael runs down the middle of the street and Billy's car races behind him. Just dart between some houses, dude. <laughs> Not that hard. They can, they can't drive after you. The most classic example of this, I think we saw it in Nomads. Pierce Brosnan was always running down the middle of the street away from the. The, the biggest one I always go to is Christine when the fat kid Christine, yeah. uh, is running away from Christine. And it's like, he's downtown. There's like a million things he can go. And he's just right down the middle of the street. Uh, they finally knock him down with a baseball bat and tower over him. Let's teach this fucker a lesson he'll never forget. We'll put, put his fucking ass in the trunk, you fucking asshole. How was this a PG-13 movie ever? It wasn't. They're dropping f bombs in every scene. PG thirteen in this back in these days, you get one f bomb. It has to be non sexual. Did you even get that in the early nineties? Yeah, that, that was one. Of, I think that was one of the the things with PG thirteen. You could have an an f bomb, but it had to be not like fuck my brains out. It had to be fuck you asshole. Well, like I said, the VHS tape was very disappointing. Well, I would I would be interested in seeing like the PG thirteen version. I looked, boys. I looked because I I thought I wasn't going to do a double feature, obviously, but I thought it would be good for all of us because I know see I want both to see both of them. I couldn't find any, and I guess we could all go to the doctors and watch the VHS tape if we weren't social distancing. Uh, and I don't have that tape anymore. I'd be worth something now, Doctor. I don't think VHS tapes are worth anything. You'd be surprised. I would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, the gang takes Billy to a wild animal park. And while it seems that the homicidal Billy has spared Michael's life one last time as the crew just leaves him there, that's not necessarily the case. I have to admit something here. The first time I watched this movie, Brace yourselves, I was drinking. I missed that it was a wild animal park because they show the sign. I thought they just took him out in the woods, which if that was the case, what happens next would make no fucking sense whatsoever. So did, was there a sign? Because I was wondering, like, yeah. did they throw there, him in the city there is, zoo? There is a sign, a big sign. They go in and it says wild animal park. It would have been pretty crazy. Like, we just dumped you here out in the yard. And, oh, my God, there's a fucking African lion. <laughs> So what I'm about to say, kind of picture it from when I'm watching it, like they just took him out to some, the woods and dropped him. Some pastor. Here's what happens next. <laughs> the thing is, though, this movie's so fucking weird, I didn't question it. Like, oh, okay. As soon as Michael's back on his feet, dusting himself off, and the bad dudes have driven away, he's immediately confronted by a giant leopard. A huge leopard. Then an African lion like Simba, like a big fucking African lion starts chasing him down. And when he tries to climb up a tree to safety, a black panther's up there, the animal, not the activist kind. And he's waiting for him up there. So he crawls back down the tree and the lion is waiting for him and starts mauling him to pieces, tearing him apart until a, a, a shotgun toting game warden shows up just in the nick of time and shoots his gun and scares the cats away. But originally, dude, picture me watching this. I thought they just dumped them like at a park or the woods, and it just happened to have all these jungle cats roaming around. 
and I still was okay with it. Like, that's <laughs> interesting screenwriting choice. Okay. When a movie gets that pass, could that kind of pass? It's pretty good. Pretty good. Wouldn't uh, it have been funnier if there were an actual Black Panther activist up in the tree? Like he climbs up there and the guy's oh, get out of my tree, honky. Sorry. It's Richard Brown trees up there with a shotgun, beat it, snowflake. It's like, God, I'll take on a lion. Sorry. Yeah, I'm better off with the fucking lion. Uh well, it is Richard Brown tree for God's sake. Shaft yeah. on uh, Turner Classic movies earlier this week. Yeah. Uh, boy, this cigar is in the final third is really, you're right, Tut. The strength just balls. It kind of beat me up, to be honest. You you said it, and now I'm there, and it's uh, I, let's give him points for consistency. Uh, yeah, mine just went full blown, like full strength and full body. The earthiness and the the leather leather has kind of bumped up above the chocolate in the final third. Man, it's full. It's a full bastard. Yeah, it's 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 a big boy cigar, which is not the NBK. The NBK is actually one of their more medium offerings in the in the Black Label Black Works lineup. Uh, which is what I like about it. It's a very refined kind of smoke. This, yeah, this thing's a powerhouse in the final third. Holy shit! <laughs> uh, real quick, uh, so we can move on. Do you guys want to talk price point? Yeah, because I'm done. Okay. <laughs> I've already got. I already got th- through with it. Discretion, Tut. Did you see the price when you picked up the cigars? No, I didn't. They didn't have an invoice or anything. Mm-mm. Okay, so this was an event only cigar. Typically meant to be handed out when you buy a box or buy you know a certain amount of cigars you can't you couldn't buy these online or unless you participated in a black label event or black works event so keep that in mind uh yeah it smoked pretty quick but i mean i'm gonna be smoking this thing for a while longer and well, granted i've taken a lot of breaks but uh Good, good flavors, great construction, uh, nice ebb and flow from medium to full to medium to full blast. Yeah, boy, I'm going to you first. Uh, that's a tough one because you said it's a specialty, so I don't know how they would. But it, I'll go. It does it, this isn't on uh, Smoker's Abbey? It's not like they gave these places free reign to put a, a price. It does have an MSRP from black label. They, they have given it a price. Keep that in mind. $9. $9. Doctor. Who didn't smoke the cigar tonight? Didn't get to smoke the cigar, so <laughs> uh, we got ton at eleven ninety nine. You said event only. Yeah. That's gonna. I'm gonna guess that that makes it higher. I'm gonna go twelve fifty. Actually, I want to say I'm not really good at math, but I think this is right about midway between Tut and Yaks. Ten fifty. Ten fifty. That's a dang good price for that. Yeah. Barber pole construction, event only cigar. I mean, a lot of strength, a lot of flavors, a little on the short side, but that didn't bother it at all. Yeah, it's a good price. I agree. Uh, and I, I, you know, Black Label is one of the ones that tends to keep their prices reasonable. Um, kind of like uh, Southern Draw, Roma, all those guys kind of managed to keep a, a rain on. Even even the ones you, you kind of have a harder time tracking down, like the Black Irish from Roma or the certain Rose of Sharon's uh, that you kind of have to search for a little bit more. I mean, they, they, they try to keep it to where you don't have to, you know, you can still drink something nice that night with it. You don't have to go broke smoking <laughs> it. Uh, that's a good price point. Ten fifty, Shit, yeah. That's a very good price. Um, and doctor, like I said, next time we are able to actually meet in person, I'll, I'll have one of these in a goodie bag for you restock your your humidor there in the office much appreciated 2024 can't get here soon enough yeah i'm sure it'll be sometime in the next five or six years 
because I gotta I gotta tell you guys, I, I I don't like this format. I like sitting at the table. I, I don't care for this. Uh, we we're giving it our best, but I I just it's been nothing but trouble and I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But it is good to see you guys on screen. Um, we, I imagine we're all kind of in the same boat. We don't get a lot of interactions with other human beings other than, you know, phones. And, and But visually, it's good to see you boys. Right? So, it's great. It's great to see you guys. Okay. Well, the next morning, let me just wet my whistle one more time here. Sorry, my, I don't know if it's that crazy final third of the cigar or this beer oh it does it, it drives it out uh that earth that just pounds you in that final third definitely drives your mouth out uh, well the next morning tammy and byron raced to the hospital where michael's in intensive care under the passed out watch of his drunken guardian uncle bob who was played by tut i don't know i didn't find i didn't know uncle bob that's right actor john goff did you guys recognize him? No. Oh, I'm surprised at you, Doctor. John Goff, this one you probably wouldn't have gotten. He looked a lot different. He was one of the ill-fated seagrass sailors with buck flowers in the fog, but he had a big beard. Okay. That's, but, what, we, that's what we did with buck flowers, the fog. There ain't no fog bank out there. There's a fog bank out there. Yeah, that was him. Good job, Todd. Yeah, we did do the fog. Here's where you would know him more. All of you would know him. You mentioned it earlier tonight. They live. He's the rich businessman at the newsstand reading the newspaper when Roddy's ah. going to help you or whatever he says. Yeah. That's him. That's Uncle Bob. Wow. So he's a carpenter guy. Um. Well, he's drunk dreaming. <laughs> he's passed out. Uh, when Billy storms in the room. Cade style. Storming in a room or passed out during an important event? Drunk, I think drunk dreaming was what Tut was alluding to. <laughs> was that in your notes, Tut? Sweet, or that just sweet <laughs> glorious drunk dream. No, you know I don't take notes. I thought with your new academia, maybe you start taking some notes. Uh, I just been cheating like a motherfucker in college. He's he's got one of those. He's coming in with like the old school calculator with the answers written down inside of it. It spies like us. He's got his arm in a cat. Yeah, he's got the he's got the fake gum out of his mouth. <laughs> like Mr. Tuttle, you're late for your exam. I'm sorry. So he, I do it he has that eye patch. Real quick, Tut. Oh God, the pressure! <laughs> Not to go on a big sidebar here, but as we as we leave Uncle Bob and and things are escalating, how do they? All your courses are online now, whereas you were accustomed to going to a classroom. I'm just curious, how do they know if you're cheating on tests if you take tests from home? Uh, different professors have different ways of doing it. There's literally like a some professors actually want you to turn the camera to where they can see you actually physically take the test and see your screens, which is stupid because you can always have someone, you know, 10 feet away from you, you know, yeah. take the test as well. Uh, a lot of times it's just the honor system. The good old honor system it has never failed us. That's how you're a doctor. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Thanks, Middle Tennessee State. Oh, I wish. <laughs> Thanks. No, and they try, they try to do it to where like a, it's timed and all that good stuff as well. Uh, okay, I was just curious how that – because there's so many things going towards the online schooling, and I was wondering just how they, how they uh, keep it honest. Uh, they really can't. I mean, unless you can actually – lock down a browser and lock down and they're only on one monitor. Like if you could actually force that browser to pop up full screen, lock it down, that's about the only way that you can. And you can't do that unless the student agrees to download something on their side. So <coughs> I don't know. 
I'm sure that somebody will come up with a platform in the future that'll ease this. But They're right probably- now, I mean, think about it. You, you took teachers who have no I or no technical you know experience whatsoever, and you asked them to turn their entire classroom or course into an online course within two weeks. Yeah. I mean, that's We're crazy. That none of you turn into the Houston Astros of our classroom. <laughs> Trash and by, the way, and and by the way, Kate, you son of a bitch, I now notice you're Fritz, Kate. Oh, how'd that happen? <laughs> Tut's like, all right, uh, 68 divided by 4.8. Dude, no, when Tut said someone could stand 10 feet away, he's looking it over there, and you look, I'm over there banging a big trash can. <laughs> Is what is the answer A or C? Which then signals his wife to hold up a board with a the whole system. It's a whole system. The whole system. Jose Altuve is over there. <laughs> Fuck! If it got me a World Series ring, the answer is B. Tut. Thank you, Jose. Uh, well, Billy storms in, and Tammy swiftly kicks him in the balls. Those doctor, those balls still have to be so sore from the ball twist. My. God, he had the double dick twist in the afternoon. Now Tammy kicks him, and she has toned cheerleader feet. I mean, good God, we can't imagine the absolute pain that a sack must be in. I. That's think, right. And sack pain. Do you think he'll be worse pain? Do you think he'll ever regain feeling in his sack again? Jesus, I'm afraid it's just far too early to tell. He's right. I know he's right. Well, when Byron threatens to scratch Weasel's eyes out with his nails, his well-manicured gay guy nails, the bad guys scurry off. They're out of there. That is assault. That is assault. As they leave, Dr. Walkenstein and Helga enter the scene. Doctor, when you do a consult at a hospital, do you ever walk in with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth and hand it to whatever physician you're dealing with? Was that, what a, was that more of a 90s thing? Are you saying I shouldn't do that? Uh, they, no, never. Not as far as anybody knows. Did they teach you that at the Poughkeepsie Institute of Technical Science? Mm-hmm, yes. That is one of many things they taught me at the pits. They tell Michael's... How long do you hold the cigarette over here? Well, they tell Michael's attending physician, Dr. Rosenthal, played by Tut. Do any of you guys recognize Dr. Rosenthal? Uh, he was that guy from that thing. Oh, it's me, Dr. Rosenpenis. Yax got it. Uh, do you guys remember the late night? It was so bad, it was great. I watched a million episodes thing blind date the dating show where they would follow and the guy would pick up the oh, chair barely barely yeah the program, like they'd have little cartoon characters at the bottom of the screen yeah but yeah Is he one of those characters back. no that's roger lodge the oh. host he's the host of oh. blind date uh, and apparently he was a he had, he had a really big role on full house that i don't remember uh but that's because doctor and i used to drink Jewish wine up in his bedroom watching Full House every Friday. I don't remember any of that. Friday night lineup. Well, it is Roger Lodge, and they tell him they're here to help the young lad. But they don't help Michael, do they, Doctor? They certainly do not. No, they do not. When they find out from Tammy that Michael has no real family, except drunk Uncle Bob, who's (laughs) still there. (laughs) And they ask him if he's reasonably a well-adjusted kid. And she's like, yeah, I guess. They pronounce him dead immediately and steal his actually very alive body effortlessly from the hospital. They just throw a blanket over him and steal the hell out of there. It's exactly the same thing they tried to do with Julian Assange. Hillary Clinton visited him in the Ecuadorian embassy, attempted to club him to death with Michelle Obama's severed penis when he wouldn't hand over the WikiLeaks files. They took his comatose body to a pizza parlor in Sandusky, Ohio, where they conducted experiments on him while George Soros and the Illuminati lizard people doodled around with prepubescent boys in the video arcade on top of a dig-dug machine. 
I've seen the video. It's out there. Google it. My God. The Dig Dug machine was a good touch. It yeah, was beautiful. I worked in Lizard People, and we're doing the Lizard Cigar there, too. I'm with Todd. I like how you worked in Dig Dug, one of my all-time favorite arcade games. You know, Jerry I made me forget Michelle Obama's severed penis when you run a Dig Dug. Jerry Seinfeld you did. blow those lizards up, Todd. Remember you, you, you mm-hmm. shoot with your yeah. Jerry Seinfeld does a he's he he explained once to Howard Stern. He does this joke about how he's how are you supposed to feel safe in a cab driven by this crazy maniacal foreigner with this. And they, they put their, their cabbie dry permits back there so you can see it. And he's like, okay, I'm safe. But the guy driving me has got a name that's spelled like the scientific formula for boron. And Howard Stern was like, why'd you pick boron out of all the elements for that joke? It works really well, but why boron? And Jerry's like, well, I went through the whole chart. And boron was just funny. It was the funniest one. I went through, I, I could have gone elevator action. I could have gone centipede. Dig Dug. Dig Dug. That's what made that. It's good out. ring. That, that made snaps. It. I mean, Hubert probably would have worked too, but Dig Dug, I can't argue with that. It. I spent about four hours on that. I, I liked it. Kind uh, of play some Dig Dug. Thanks, boys. <laughs> and it was an underrated game. I was a big Dig Dug fan. I love Dig Dug. I was too. If I ever had a son, if I ever had a son that I was going to name him Dig Dug Cade, which would have pretty much guaranteed he would appear in one of these films we do. I think <laughs> Boron Cade would have been better. It's got a nice ring to it. Chlorophyll, more like Borophyll, am I right? <laughs> uh, well, I got Lizard in there too, which is expert level cigar pairing shit right there don't try that at home you other weak ass cigar podcasts expert level shit so it would have probably gone burger time or something i like burger time oh, that, was, that was burger that was time that was on the intellivision that was that a great was a, game. that was a home that was a home game that wouldn't have worked but, but you're right those other weak ass cigar podcasts would have gone they wouldn't have known it you know what we're doing <laughs> Did anybody besides me who played many hours of burger time think that it was a brainwash thing to prepare you for a career in the food service industry? You ran along making burgers as fast as you could. It was a conspiracy, Mincy, set up by Burger King Incorporated. Michelle Obama severed penis. <laughs> Those weren't 80-20% ground meat patties you were putting on the burger time. Or 97-3, they tasted like shit. 97-3, 97% pig, chicken, whatever the hell they could find. The other 7%, I think you know where I'm going with this, with Michelle Obama's ding dong. Google it. <laughs> so Dr. Walkenstein, Helga, and Bobby take the drugged up Michael back to their warehouse where they implant his brain into the mechanical T-Rex. It's a bloody, gruesome procedure. The doctor's just working that bone saw. Blood is spraying all over Bobby's face. How was this ever a PG-13 movie? Well, that's what I was saying. I would like to see the PG-13 version because, like, how would you cut this scene out? Paul Walker's head is cut in half, and they show it. It, It's crazy. There's blood splatter everywhere. Poor muscle-bound Gunther. They show him puking up his lunch. As they're peeling apart Paul Walker's oh. it's so graphic. They even fuck with his brain by poking it with a scalpel and making his teenage wang bounce up. PG-13! And my God, that wang. It was like Tommy Lee, Matt Cade-esque. <laughs> well, Tommy Lee, anyway. And they're all laughing as they make his little teenage wiener jump around. Like, they're just having a blast with the whole thing. Um, this... This would be a great time to mention that the very, I thought, very impressive special effects here were performed by the legendary John Carl Buschler, who is best known to horror nerds, yeah. Mency. Uh, well, also, there's a Terry Kaiser tie-in. He directed Friday Part 7. John Carl Buschler, who did the effects of this movie, directed Friday 13 Part 7, which we'd mentioned earlier, starring Dr. Walkenstein as the evil psychiatrist. Um, but, man... 
he passed away uh, a few years ago and he's one of the greatest practical special effects masters that's ever lived. He did a ton of classic horror films. God rest his soul. This shit just looks so damn good. It looked really good. It did. And Doctor, he also did all the kills in our beloved Halloween 4. Yeah, no, he was a really noted, uh, really kind of up there with the, the Nick the Rob, and the of those kind of guys. The, yeah, he was kind of in the 80s and 90s. He was kind of the go-to guy for just drop, jaw-dropping practical effects. He's and it, 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 whatever problems people have with Friday 7, which he directed, all that thing making Jason a giant lizard man, uh, Okay, we go back to it time and time again. There was a time when people did these things by hand, and uh, he was one of them. He was a yeah. pioneer in, in those effects. And the lizard men exist, Doctor. You've seen them. I know you've been Poughkeepsie. They did experiments back in the late 80, 1983, 84. There's tapes you can see. I've witnessed them. Go to Google. And I had the high score on Joust. Joust would have been a good Yeah, Joust would have been good. I'm going to stick with Dick Doug. No, no, Dig Dug's the right call. Dig Dug's the right call. Four hours to come up with Dig Dug. But maybe later on I'll sing the Frogger theme song. And I did. Well, I thought about about Frogger and Centipede and those things because that would have been a tabletop game where if the lizard people and Hillary Clinton were doodling preview as in boys, it would make sense to throw them on top of a tabletop game but then I was like, no, I think that just the, the vocal reaction from saying Dig Dug supersedes the logistics of a tabletop game. And that's kind of how I got to where I did. And I didn't do some bullshit where I Googled 80s video games. I just went in here, boys. I just did it all in here. And you thought we needed to be together at the table? Well, I miss seeing you in person. There's all kinds of stuff happening on the show tonight. <laughs> <Good> <laughs> doodling on tabletops dennis richards i'll tell you this dad gum i'm gonna get me another dad gum ipa <laughs> all right doctor we'll be here um did you light up a follow-up cigar yet i did what are, you, what are you smoking well i had to follow the barber pole with another barber pole and it consists i got the cao america here you go the first barber pole i ever smoked I am enjoying it. Uh, I haven't had one of those in years. I need to revisit that one. Are you smoking something, Tut? Yeah, the uh, 300 Hands. From Southern Draw. The Connecticut. From Southern Draw. Connecticut. Uh, we did that on the show end of last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all really liked it. One of the best uh, on your wallet and your palate cigars out there. So, uh, Hey, tell us more about the first barber pole you ever smoked. I was, I was glad you were gone during that. I was hoping you uh, I was right over here. I heard you. Uh, moving on, uh, will they implant the brain into the T-Rex successfully? And as Walkenstein and Helga wander off to celebrate with some sweaty scientist sex, Bobby and Gunther order a well-deserved pizza. And the pizza delivery boy is played by Huta. Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. Efren Ramirez, who we have also seen before on this podcast. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. He was a horny teenager making love in the woods who got killed by the King Cobra. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. We were smoking the SNR Serpent in the Rainbow cigar from Blackwork Studio. Incestuous. All coming together, boys. So I feel like there was another Napoleon Dynamite tie into this movie. The chick Helga was in Napoleon. Helga. That, okay, she was. Was she the one of the housewives who the Uncle Rico was selling shit to? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Didn't recognize her until y'all said that. Yeah. Look at all of this knowledge that gets spit out. <laughs> no shit. No shit. Remember, as Hunter Thompson said, boys, morality is temporary, wisdom is permanent. Email that to me. I'm going to have to figure that one out later. It sounds good. You're not used to thinking on the TNCC podcast. I'm not used to thinking most of the day. Well, Dr. Scooby-Doo can (laughs) do-do. 
Think about that one. Dad, what's a Muppet? Well, it's not quite a sock, and it's not quite a puppet, but man, the short answer is I don't know. Well, uh, Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite drops the pizza and runs off <laughs> screaming when the T-Rex suddenly springs to life. And a few minutes later, when Gunther and Bobby, they're sitting there eating their pizza, when Gunther tosses his discarded pizza crust into Paul Walker's scalp that's just hanging out there, what a dis- you guys thought I disrespected Paul Walker earlier. He throws a pizza crust into his, his severed head. That really sets off the lizard. As Gunther goes out to get the car, Bobby starts stapling Paul Walker's head back together to deliver him to the morgue. And he unwisely starts taunting the dinosaur, even mimicking his tiny arms. There's no way you're going to be better than my computer, man. Do a little T-Rex arms. <laughs> he squeals in delight right before it's, the T-Rex bites his fucking head off and spits it out. This is a wonderful scene. I love it. Go ahead. His perfect for the body. perfect PG-13 movie. Not only does he bite his head off and spit him out, which sends his headless body flying across the room into some boxes, but then here's what makes it awesome. They show his tiny T-Rex arm pick the skin. <laughs> Once again, the this is where thing, this, the funniest things in the movie. This is the beginning of, of a lot of questions in this movie. That is a dope ass kill, man. That I loved that. Kill. I'm on. I'm on board with any head shot that has the body walking like six or seven feet and then falling down. Yeah, I we, love that stuff. We got that in Warriors of the Wasteland where the headless guy rode his motorcycle for a while. Yeah. We got it in a uh, Turbo uh, Kid, I think. Turbo Kid when the thing landed on the guy's head. It was uh yeah, there's nothing funnier than a guy without a head. <laughs> <laughs> or or the ultimate, the all-time classic is Return of the Living Dead, where the corpse gets up and does the little maneuver with his head on. <laughs> there's a cool moment where the lizard picks up a mirror off the table and studies his face with his little bitty t-rex hands as he looks down on michael's body it's like his oh this tiny is- t-rex hands apparently can do so many things it can reach up and pick his teeth <laughs> when literally they're like two feet long and its head is like clearly eight feet away well i'm sorry i just looking so at many him, questions he's looking at himself in the mirror as he's looking down at his former body and I know it sounds stupid to say anything in Tammy and the T-Rex or Tanny and the Teenage T-Rex or Tranny and the Teenage T-Rex. I know it's stupid to say that anything in this movie has any kind of emotional resonance, but I thought it came kind of close. No? You guys aren't helping me either? No. <laughs> That's a really- I, was, I was okay with you until you used the phrase emotional resonance. <laughs> Which is a synth band that Tut and I are working on putting together. Uh, yeah, you're going to open up for uh, Stacey Keach's Ponytail. Emotional Resonance will be opening up for Stacey Keach's Ponytail. <laughs> By the way, Tut, I know you're a music historian. I, I told Kay that I thought Tammy and the T-Rex was a band that opened up in 1978 for Lou Reed at a CBGB <laughs> show in New York City. So that would be tranny. Pretty sure they did. That would be Tranny and the Teenage Tranny and the Teenage T-Rex opening up for Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground tonight at Max's Kansas City. Don't forget to come back next week for Blondie. So dinosaur, opening dance, Stacy Keach's ponytail. So the dinosaur proceeds to wig the fuck out as he squashes poor Gunther to smithereens. The T-Rex then walks over to a nearby payphone. And with his stubby little arms, he acts, dials up Tammy's number, but obviously she can't understand his groaning. This sounds familiar. I guarantee you, in 1994, my girlfriend got some 2 a.m. calls on a, from a payphone <laughs> where I sounded like this fucking T-Rex. <laughs> no comment. And then for good measure, 50% of the was a 1994 payphone. He had the good sense to check if there was that quarter. I, I missed that. Did he put his little claw in the quarter? He, did. he got, 
His arms are so articulate. He's over there dialing the number. Where would he put the quarter? He doesn't have any pants. I don't know. But at least he did it, and I was happy about that. Did anybody like, else think that was one of the funniest parts of the movie was the use of the T-Rex's fingers? Like yes. when it became articulate and dialed the phone. That's when I laughed out loud. Like he's all oh, punch some numbers now. But the other question is, how was his tiny arm holding the phone up? Well, we didn't it see just, that. But again, I think in 1994 at 2 a.m. when I was making those payphone calls, I probably looked like the T-Rex with kind of my, my, my hands were all... Uh, Doctor, a lot of Jewish wine those nights. Uh, yes, I believe some Manischewitz was involved. Meanwhile, at a rockin' high school house party, those nasty bitches who set up Michael are still trying to win over Billy as a dejected Tammy in a very tight-fitting pink sweater. And Byron drowned their sorrows. She just doesn't see how she's ever going to get over this, even though Byron assures her that, hey, you dropped some wisdom on us a minute ago, Doctor. Here's some wisdom for you. He says, time heals all wounds and she'll live to love again. Here, here. I think that's true. She's young. Technically, they weren't even dating. And if you're that hot, you're going to live to love again. Someone's going to try and love you. She's going to go to USC, hook up with a linebacker. She's going to be just fine. But when Billy shows up, the nerve of this guy showing up at this party after killing Michael, Jamie blows him off for good and races away. So he starts making out with one of the troublemaker skanks on the dance floor. Byron is at the bar. Get this. This house party has a real fucking cocktail style bartender. Yax, your party's never had that shit. It doesn't make any sense. They had a DJ. They had a bar. Whose house is this? They didn't explain that. No, but Yax did have a band open up at one of his house parties called Troublemaker Skanks. No. I did what I could. <laughs> Resources available. It was Yaks playing his mixtape. Mm -hmm. When the T-Rex suddenly shows up to start evening the score, they all think his thundering footsteps are an earthquake at first, but nope, it's a T-Rex at a high school house party and he's super pissed off. First, Weasel wanders off to take a piss in the woods and he gets gutted by the T-Rex's clawed hands. Love it. Seeing that giant fucking dinosaur doesn't phase him one bit. Who put this stupid thing out here? Dude, I have been drunker than any man on earth. I have never been so drunk where if I went into the woods to take a piss and looked up and saw a Tyrannosaurus Rex staring at me, I'd be like, piss on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would have been. You had a party dude. with me. I'm yeah. Fritz Cade. Let me show you my Triceratops, motherfucker. Actually, you're you're right, Doctor. I, I I've been that drunk. Yeah. By the way, this this house party scene is the greatest scene in the movie. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. When 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 he shows up and goes ape shit, <laughs> biting heads off. This is the best scene in the movie. Uh, I like it. Yeah. He, that's his go-to move is the the biting the heads off. Well, he uh, takes care of Weasel. Then the T-Rex makes his way over to Billy's convertible where he, he's, banging, he's banging one of those skanks. He chomps down on the floozy that Billy's banging in the back seat. Sir, Hold sir. on. Billy is banging that skank. I mean, I mean come on. You, you, well, can't, you can't, you can't uh, escape this scene where I, she looks up, sees the T-Rex. She starts screaming. He's like, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You know, no. he's all, I'm good, aren't I? I'm good, aren't I? See, I wanted you guys to fill in the blanks there because I felt kind of weird doing that. Uh, doctor, what was he saying again? I'm good, aren't I? I'm good. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? And she's screaming her head off because she sees the T-Rex, but he takes, Billy takes that as a... And she delivered her into the throes of ecstasy. Yes. Matt Cade and Tommy Lee stuff. I was cracking up, man. You know, I mean, if there were a real person named Fritz Cade, maybe I'd go along with that. I'm changing my name to Fritz Cade. <laughs> As Billy runs back to the party and tries to warn everybody that a dinosaur is on the loose and they need to call the Popo, that's police to you non-hip listeners, 
The T-Rex returns back to the house party and starts stomping the shit out of Billy's gang before, dude, I didn't see this coming, chomping Billy's head clean off. I thought they would save that revenge kill for the, for end. the end. Billy's our main bad guy. Nope. <laughs> Bites his head right off. And even when his head gets bit and spit off, one of the drunk party chicks like, that's just Billy being stupid. <laughs> Classic Billy. Classic Billy. <laughs> Headless corpse. <laughs> around. I love how they actually have to see until it's not enough that his headless corpse drops. Huh. Then the head actually falls, and then they all lose their shit. Yeah, well, let's see if the head shows up. Oh, okay. He did this last weekend. Well, I mean, put it in this perspective. If we were all sitting around in our senior year of high school getting drunk on a Saturday night party and some animatronic dinosaur showed up, grabbed somebody by the head, wouldn't we wait until it came clean off we ran away from all that beer? One of us is We would, yes. Bit. But beer. they don't need to. They have their own bartender. Except yeah. you, Yaks. You and Kate would have been stuffing those beers in your jean jackets and running away. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. We would have already fleeced the place. It would have been... Yeah, you guys would have been long gone. Left. I would have been fucking there like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> Typical Billy. Huh? Classic <laughs> Billy. Uh... The T-Rex does spare Byron. He even goes up to him and dusts some... With his, with his little T-Rex <laughs> arms that somehow can reach out, pick him off the ground. Oh, he's close. Dude, the dinosaur fingers are hilarious. It gives him a little pat off. <laughs> Remember, it's still Michael in there, and he cares for Byron because he's close to Tammy. Do you like how I turned on my sensitive voice to... Yeah, I, I did enjoy that, Fritz. Transition the... <laughs> the T-Rex goes on to squash a bunch of other thugs' heads in. Dude, they crawl under a car. We'll be safe under here. So he just climbs on top, jumps. Dude, we see their heads completely like pumpkins. Get squashed, blood everywhere. PG-13. I'm going to find that fucking PG-13 movie, and we're going to watch it. Because I'm I'm more curious about the fact that if you cut out all these scenes, you're going to have, like, what, 45 minutes of a well, movie? Guess, well, no, I'm guessing there has to be other scenes that are more... That filled it in? That filled it in that are more the PG-13 stuff, more, like, stuff that we wouldn't like. There was 45 minutes on Uncle Bob's backstory. It just went all over the place. That might Maybe actually be pretty interesting. I'm drunk. Uh, well, then he wanders off into the woods right before the police arrive on the scene. Boy, you get how Michael Myers or Jason could recede into the woods and, and kind of disappear. This is a big fucking dinosaur. But look at these cops. There's a hilarious scene where the deputies, led by Buck Flowers, discover the mangled bodies at the party and start poking them with sticks as they casually eat pork rinds, while the sheriff, Byron's father, gets understandably sick to his stomach at the sight of all the carnage. Is that, is that his head, the sheriff asks? Well, it ain't no watermelon. <laughs> That's racist. No, I mean, he's just saying it's not a watermelon. Sheriff Black. That's his name. I thought that was kind of racist right there. I thought that was kind of racist. Raffle was living high on Ice Pirates money, and some choices were made. You can't touch me. You can't touch me. Touch me. Oh, you know what? How about I just pull up my Rolodex? Oh, Robert Urich. Got his number right here. You want me to call him? No, no, no. It's cool. <laughs> Nick Yax's comment, living high on Ice Pirates money, might be the funniest thing that gets said in this podcast. That's all I ever wanted in life, boys, was to live high on Ice Pirates money. Hey, 1994, we didn't have all this millennial hatred. Oak wasn't around back then. Well, apparently, no, but apparently, I will say this. I did read somewhere that in the PG-13 cut, there's a lot more anti-gay stuff towards Byron the high school like they throw out queer and fag and like a lot of like that wasn't in this cut there's only one kind of mention derogatory thing towards Byron apparently that stuff was in the other cut yeah 
I can uh, say that. It was the 90s. It was the 90s, and they kind of used gay characters in the wrong way. Uh, well, I mean, he was definitely the stereotypical comedic relief gay guy. He was, but to this version's credit, they don't really make a stink about it. Even Billy never like when they get when Byron gets in Billy's. Face. No, you're actually yeah yeah that's actually right because I mean even though he was the stereotypical '90s '80s gay comic relief character, they didn't go like you know full Lamar on him to where you know they made. No, fun. They, they didn't go Lamar Luttrell, and Billy never was like back off fag or back off like they yeah. they didn't go there in this cut, but apparently there was more of that in the PG-13 cut. I can't verify that. They didn't They didn't do that, that's correct, but it's still extremely farcical. And Cade, uh, alluding to an earlier conversation we had the day about, oh, we were talking about the Schmitz Gay commercial um, from Saturday Night Live. Remember Schmitz Gay where... The, the, oh yeah, Chris Farley and uh, Sandler? Sandler and Farley. By the perform the, the the way the character was written, even in the cut that we watched, was farcical and would certainly be uh, it, it would have had you know there would have been outrage on it today as far as well, just the depiction of the character. Yeah, you can't do anything today without no. That's true. Upsetting people, but no guys. We uh, Yax and and Tut, we we're talking about because we we're we we're sending through our group text. Uh, amongst the four of us, we're sending back a bunch of Schmitz gay Saturday Night Live gifts uh, on a certain thing. And we, all of a sudden, Dr. And I were talking, like, I asked him, I was like, do you think they could do that skit now? Saturday Night Live could. If you're thirsty and you're gay. Uh, it would tut, no way. No, man, today you would be haters. I don't think they could do that these nowadays. I, th I think that would be completely like suicide. You're right. It would have been a, a living color skit. Sandler and Farley would be roasted for for being in something like that. Yeah, it would never go over today. Um, that, that probably came out around the time of this movie. It would, but you would have to have known gay actors delivering it. Which was the point of the joke was so funny. It was at Sandler and Farley playing these two gay guys. I mean, it was yeah, those two dudes are in their twenties at this point. They're probably going out and crushing pussy after this is over with. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Well, the sheriff instructs his deputies to go find some clues. Is that a thing? Is any police sh sheriff or cat ever said that in the history of law enforcement? All right, go find some clues. No, but I kind of like that. Maybe Sherlock Holmes, like in the old days? Good point. My dear Watson, go up and find some clues. I don't even think they said that in those old-timey days. Like, that's crazy. Anything I have to go on? No, nah, just give me some clues. You got it, Sherry. We'll start looking. We got our magnifying glasses. We'll start looking for some clues. I'll be over here at the I'll be over here at the Stacy Keach's Ponytail Tavern drinking. You oh, found a found a one legged dead girl. Still good looking though. Buck flower. I love that line. Suddenly, a drunk party chick approaches them, and she tells them that it was a dinosaur that did all this. Even the sheriff's son Byron tells him it was indeed a T Rex that did all this. But obviously, that's a tough clue to swallow. The sheriff orders that all the victims and survivors of this massacre be tested for drugs immediately. He, he's convinced they're all high and seeing shit. I mean, come on. It's a dinosaur. A text. <laughs> when, when did that song, The Dinosaur, come out? Who, who did that song? Was that more Stay in the Time? Mm -mm. Oh, it's no. the late 80s. Well, there were two of them, right? There was one that was in the original Batman movie with Jack Nicholson and Michael Keaton. And then there was, uh, there was a different one where they did the little dinosaur movements. Everybody yeah, that was the dinosaur dance. dance. Get on the floor, everybody's doing the dinosaur, and it was like a big hit. That was, that was late eighties. Okay. Was it the same group that did the butt? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> doing dinosaur. the butt, da -na, da -na. sack, so you're, you're sack, think, sack. You're thinking of a you're thinking of the digital underground with Humpty. No, 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 were, no, 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 It was it was it was walk the dinosaur with by was not was. 
Oh, was not what it was. Don was. It was a he's a big time producer and he had a band, was not was. Who did doing the butt? Yeah, boy, can you look that up? Because you're right, Tut. That was its own thing and it was it was something that happened. <laughs> it was awesome, is what it, you mean to say. Uh did you ever do the butt, Tut? Uh after seeing the Spike Lee film School Days, yes. Was that in School Days? Uh yes. Oh my God, there's so much double entendres involved here. <laughs> Did you ever do the butt tut on my school days? All day long. The butt was Experience Unlimited. Experience Unlimited, EU. Boy, that's worse than any of those fake band names we came up with tonight. That's like a horrible band name. Stacy, Stacy Keach's ponytail is better than Experience is Unlimited. Troublesome skanks? We did way better than that. And by yeah. the way, doing the butt is often an unlimited experience. Hey, here's a little trivia for you. Uh, since Tut threw it out there, you want to know a little something? You know, I, I find these films for us, and I, I'd like to think I'm a fairly well-rounded cinephile and that I've seen a, a lot of movies over my years. I have never, I have only, I, I, let me caveat, I have only seen one Spike Lee movie in my entire life. Okay. I guess I have only seen one. The only one that I have seen is the Denzel Washington as Malcolm, Malcolm X. X. I've never seen anything else. Love that movie. I saw Girl 6. He did about phone sex operators. Never even heard of that. I haven't good. seen that one. It's good. And I actually have, I got free HBO on, uh, for like a weekend. I, and I recorded the Black Klansman because I heard that was pretty good. I haven't seen that yet. I never saw Do the Right Thing. I never saw School Days. And I know these are really important films, but I, I never saw any of that shit. Do the Right Thing. What was the uh, one with Wesley Snipes? The Jungle Fever. Jungle uh, Fever. No Better Blues. Mm -hmm. I never saw any I of that. Guess, I, guess, uh, I was a Spike Lee fan back in the day. I guess if I was going to look at one, I know that Do the Right Thing was uh, considered for a lot of awards. So I would kind of be interested in seeing that. Uh, but Malcolm X is the only one that I've ever actually seen. I know they remade a film of his that sounded very interesting called Old Boy. Oh, yeah, he did old, he did the Old Boy remake. No, uh, he, he remade, I thought he did the original. No, 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 he remade Old Boy. He remade Old Boy. Okay, that sounded like an interesting movie to me. I've seen the original Old Boy, the Japanese film. Was it good? I'm going to get in trouble now. It was an Asian film. For okay. That it was Japanese. It, it, it was uh, a really good uh, film. I never saw Spike Lee's version of it. Well, I was, uh, I was interested. I think he put, I, I want to say he put Josh Brolin into the lead role. Pulled this off my library. I have actually read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Same here. Uh, so uh, an, an outstanding book. I was very interested in the, in the movie. Same so, here. Is that what Malcolm X called his book? Uh, yes. Autobiography? Yeah. Well, he wrote it with Alex Haley, the guy that wrote Roots. Yeah. So it's it's actually called The Autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley. Um, and written right before he was assassinated. Uh, I, I really, and Malcolm X, very interesting person. I, I yes. love the movie. Denzel Washington, you know, saying Denzel Washington's a great actor is, is pretty ridiculous. I mean, of course he is. Um, yeah, I've never, I've never seen another Spike Lee movie, and not for any particular reason. Um, he did small indie movies, and they never really played much in the theater, so I, I never really saw one. Um, reading, reading the book and watching Spike Lee's Malcolm X, that was a very good book adaptation. It was. The, the book's fascinating. I mean, he was a fascinating person. Um, yeah. The movie was great. I, I've never... Um, I know Spike Lee's been kind of, can, you know, he's kind of been chastised for reverse racism. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I, I would be interested in seeing Do the Right Thing just because I, I heard a, a lot about that as, as that being a movie that actually had some resonance. I, some of his other things. You know, I think a lot of his movies did. Uh, even School Days. The, one of the things that I think School Days was a very underrated movie is that 
you know, when you go in to do the right thing, it's definitely a, a white black friction there. School days was actually a black, a dark skin, light skin friction within the black community. I thought that that had a lot of resonance as well. Uh, I, I appreciate what Lee does. I mean, sometimes he goes a little overt in his message, but I, I, I mean, you can, it's easy to, to be critical of some of the things that he does, but I, I appreciate him. In the late nineties, he made a movie called son of Sam. Or oh yeah. Yeah. Or it was about Son of Sam. I don't know if, it was, if that was the name of it. Summer of Sam. Summer of Sam. I didn't see it. A couple of friends of mine did. And these were people without any agenda and like totally didn't. And they just said it was horrible. Really? So, uh, yeah, there, there'd be some. Up, but I'm with you, Kate. Other than Malcolm X, which I really just saw for, uh, which is something that Denzel just carries. Uh, I've, I've never seen any of his movies. Okay. Not by, cho- not by any sort of platform or choice. Well, uh, I would encourage Tut, who sounds like he's seen a lot of Spike Lee movies, uh, to see Girl Six because Girl Six. It, it was. I, I went through a big. I actually wrote a screenplay for an African American lead female because I was really. I just got into this like two year thing where I was just obsessed with black exploitation films and Pam Greer films. And I, I wrote this script, which probably I would get just roasted for now. This rando white guy writing this, this script for, you know, you just can't do certain things anymore, I guess. But, but it was about this, this woman working kind of reluctantly into the, the phone sex industry and i just caught it on tv like halfway through and i really dug it so i ordered the dvd or bought the dvd and it was like it was really really good okay and none of his other stuff really kind of and i'll be honest i've just never been a guy who's really gravitated towards message movies well it was funny because like uh when i watched school days i was like in my high school years you know this is back what late eighties, early nineties. Uh, you know, it's got Lawrence Fishburne. It's got all the, it's basically like all the cast from, uh, that old NBC sitcom, a different world. So it's like all those characters. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I, I remember really just being moved by the movie. And then I watched the final scene, which is the message scene of the entire thing. I watched it like about three weeks ago and I was just like, Oh man, that's horrible. <laughs> It is so preachy. It is so preachy. But uh, 18-year-old Tut loved it. 40-something Tut was like, uh, come on, stop preaching at me. Yeah, there's a there's a giant, vast cavern. A cavern so deep between 20-year-old Cade and 40-year-old Cade, cinema-wise. It's, it's probably I, a good thing. I used to be the dude that would keep you up all night popping in laser discs of the most obscure shit. And just like, I'm so clever for finding this. And it's, it's, and now like, I just want to see chicks washing cars with, <laughs> with their tops off. It's really all I got time for now. And it's all I'm really interested in. And thank God I have an avenue here to, to share it with you people. Uh, but, but I should say 20 year old K would be so disappointed. in me. <laughs> you, you were beautiful, man. You were beautiful. You had so much goddamn hope and talent. I cannot wait to see what the next two decades bring to you, brother. And then skip ahead, and he's just like, <laughs> "Fuck you, you little son of a bitch. You fucking sell out." Anyway, moving on. <laughs> The next morning at the warehouse, Helga is rolling up poor Gunther's squashed up corpse like a rug. Dude, this T-Rex squashed him, and dude, she's just rolling him up. Get him inside. While some doctors will be freaked out at their mad experiment gone haywire, Dr. Walkenstein is invigorated. He's created a machine with feelings, with passion, with opinions. He tells Helga, as she continues to roll up Gunther's flattened body like a pizza roll, that they're on the brink of something very special. 
You know what else is very special, boys? What's, What's special, Cade? Glad you asked. I'm talking about the sweet aromatic smoke pouring off the foot of a Pappy Van Winkle's Family Reserve barrel fermented cigar from Drew Estate. I just lit up a original Herrera Esteli from Drew Estate. Mm-hmm. The smoke that comes off at Pappy Van Winkle is like nothing you will ever smoke in the cigar world. This unique stogie is a long filler premium cigar rolled in limited quantities at La Grande Fabrica Drew Estate in Esteli, Nicaragua. Deep barrel fermentation is the key process that makes this expression vastly different from anything else on the market. Hand-selected leaves from Kentucky are packed into small torquettes, which are then loaded strategically into oak bourbon barrels. Water is then added, while immense pressure is applied to torquettes via railroad jacks, not car jacks, not wolfman jacks, railroad jacks. The tobacco is removed two, three times per year, shaken out. We've seen it done. These guys are experts at what they do. Then repacked. Mark Ryan has come up with a system there in Louisiana that nobody has ever been able to replicate. And why would they dare? The total process of fermentation takes 12 to 18 months, leaving a truly unique flavor profile and aroma. The Pappy Van Winkle's Family Reserve Barrel Fermented is now available. Forever, it was only on pappyco.com, on the Pappy Van Winkle website. It is now available at every brick and mortar Drew Diplomat retailer everywhere. You still have to go to pappyco.com to get the flying pig size. Have you smoked yours yet, Yeah, Boy? I have not. We got one in Nicaragua. I still have not. I smoked. haven't smoked mine yet. You didn't get one of those times. That's a, a Nicaragua exclusive. All right, I'll give you mine. Is that what you, <laughs> is that what you want? What do you want from no, me? No, 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 no. Uh, Take but, the pen. Take the pen, Jerry. If you, <laughs> I don't want the pen. All right, I'll take the pen. Uh, so if you want to smoke that unique pig size Vitola, head over to pavico.com as that's the only place you'll find it. But I highly encourage you, if you are a cigar smoker who wants to venture outside the norm, dip your toes into the world of the Pappy Van Winkles because it, it embraces two very unique ecosystems in that it brings in the Kentucky side of American tobacco and the Louisiana side of Perique tobacco. And we have been blessed to go to all five Drew State Barn smokers and the Kentucky and Louisiana aspects of the American tobacco experience are by far the most unique. And to see a cigar that is based so much in those two locations, um, there's really nothing like it. And if, even if it's not in your wheelhouse, you owe it to yourself to try it. Mm -hmm. Concur. But I will do a producer's note. Uh, Mark, Mark didn't invent the, uh, Pepper or the uh, uh, he'll be the first, he'll be the first to tell you that he didn't invent the, that. <laughs> the Native Americans actually invented it and he just resurrected it. He did basically save it. He saved the Perique industry. Yes, he did. Um, I think if you are a fan of the Larutin line from Drew Estate, if you're a fan of the uh, Pepe and Winkles, then you owe a huge amount of debt not only Drew Estate, but to Mark Ryan and the work he has done in Louisiana and with his parish. Go, go. I don't, I think right now the only barn smoker that has been postponed due to the uh, COVID-19 is Florida. All the other ones are still on schedule. So yeah, especially like Louisiana was like way late in the year. Yeah, I think that's uh, October. Yeah. So get your ass to Louisiana, get your ass to Kentucky. If you just go to those two alone, you're going to see the most unique processes that you could possibly see with American tobacco. And uh, maybe someday again, we'll see you there. I'm so, I like my uh, Mark. He's a, he's an interesting son of a bitch. I love that dude. Um, we've been fortunate over the five years of the show to meet some really, really interesting people. And I would put Mark Ryan in Louisiana at the top of that list. 
um, boy, guys that live and breathe tobacco, like that is their jam. That is, they wake up thinking about tobacco. They go to bed thinking about tobacco. They make things happen that no one else in the industry is doing as far as tobacco. Like those guys fascinate the hell out of me. And the family that runs the Kentucky farm and Mark Ryan in Louisiana and those, the, pardon my French, the crazy fucker that owns the Connecticut farm. These guys are, they live and bleed tobacco in their own special ways. And it is just amazing to spend some time with them and do it. If, if you love, something as much as these guys do, then I envy you because it's, it's good to have passion in your life. And all these farmers from Pennsylvania and Florida, Jeff and Florida, all these guys just, they, they have such passion for tobacco. It's inspiring. And apparently they can keep us safe from the coronavirus. So they're saving lives. Yeah. Speaking of passion, I know that Fritz Cade has now become Cade X. Oh, did you change me, Todd? No. Did you do something on my uh, screen here? No. Kdex. Spike yeah. Tut. Spike Tut and Kdex. Boy, I'm... That uh, must have been some kind of glitch. All right. Well, you know what else is very special besides Pappy Van Winkle Cigars, boys? What is? This next scene where Denise Richards enters her bedroom fresh out of the shower wearing only her lazy negligence. Here it is. Here it is. We're going right. We're going there, right? What are you about to go and do? I'm going samurai collar. I'm just gonna do this. Yeah, boy, did I use that term negligee correctly? You did. You did indeed. I caramba. Okay, here's the thing. This came out in the early '90s. So during her cheerleader thing, and then this, I started to wonder. Should 40-year-old Kate <laughs> feeling kind of weird about watching? No, no, no. Dude, she's older than us. She was 23 when she made this movie. It's totally okay to have those feelings watching this movie. Especially if your name is Kate X. No, I'm just Kate now. I fixed Tut. Tut did some stuff. Spike I Tut rebuttal? So her- No, because I, I remember 18-year-old Tut's feelings and... That's what it brings about. So her 23-year-old breasts are swaying to and fro with a rhythmic pattern solely their own. It's okay to enjoy the scene. She was 23, boy. <laughs> Doctor! Was this before uh, Was this before Troopers or not? Starship? No, no. Several this, years before Starship Troopers. This was her first uh, feature film. Okay, all right. Uh, she had one. Yeah. Where she actually had a lead role. Uh, she was in. Uh, she had one small cameo in another film, but everything else she did prior to that was uh, TV. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually Tut, till you mentioned that I forgot her in Super Troopers. Uh, Starship. Or Starship Troopers. I'm sorry. Um, that's well, right. What about my movie? Do the wrong thing. <laughs> well, no, Doctor. We'll- Get to that if we have time. If we have time. Where was I? Oh, so as her 23 year old breasts sway to and fro with a rhythmic pattern solely their own, our dinosaur makes his way to her bedroom window. He knows the way. And when she sees her ex almost lover in T Rex form, she screams so hard she passes out. I've been there. And the lizard takes her to a barn. How's he carrying her with those little tiny arms? <laughs> he can do everything with them. He can dial a phone, hold it, pick up people, brush the dirt off them. He takes her to a barn on the outskirts of town somehow. Through a surprisingly effective game of charades, the T-Rex is able to communicate to Tammy that he is Michael and his brain has been implanted into the dinosaur. So she starts caressing his dinosaur snout. Dude, I've been locked in my house for over two months with my kids and we play charades. I do this shit. 
They don't get I'm an elephant. The fucking dinosaur got her to understand that he's Michael, that his brain was implanted in this fucking thing. I'm calling bullshit. And I'm going to tell Katie that that uh, your dad doesn't think you're as smart as Denise Richards. If we're doing charades and I do this. I knew you were an elephant. Thank you, Ted. I thought you were doing the David Carradine maneuver from Lone Wolf McQuaid. Ted and I are okay again. Yeah. Well, now Tammy is now reconnected fully with her thought to be lost almost lover. Dude, she's totally, she knows everything. Through a little game of charades, she, she gets it. And instead of freaking out and running out the barn, you know, she's like, all right, you're cool. Yeah. Back at Tammy's house, the sheriff, Sheriff Black, <laughs> is informing her hapless, totally useless parents. Dude, the dad did nothing when Billy stormed in the house. Now he's kind of just bumbling around in his robe that it appears as if a dinosaur has kidnapped their teenage daughter. But wait, before they can question that, wait, you're blaming this shit on dinosaur? Tammy appears in her nightgown from the backyard, and she's super happy dancing around. She tells her bungling, stupid-ass parents and the sheriff that it must have been a meteor, not a dinosaur, that destroyed half their house. And she's totally okay. But Dr. Walkenstein and Helga are observing from a car across the Walkenstein. street. Walkenstein. <laughs> I'm sorry, it never gets old. Are observing from a car across the street, and they can tell by the way that she's walking that Tammy has already been with the T-Rex, and she's their perfect bait. A lot of people who've looked at... Donald's ex-girlfriends. Doctor, if Tammy had been with the T-Rex, would she be walking? I don't know about that. If she was walking, she'd certainly be walking funny. Uh, she might need a wheelbarrow to get pushed around in. Tammy tells Byron that Michael's brain is alive inside the T-Rex, and he totally gets it. Oh, at the party, he dusted me off. Yeah, he's on board. She tells her BFF they have to get Michael's body back. And she thinks they should do it at the funeral. Makes sense. It makes Denise Richards sense. It makes this movie sense. She married Charlie Sheen. It makes Denise Richards sense. I forgot oh, about God. that. Well, oh, winning. He was for a while. He was making about $2 million an episode on Two and a Half Men. So, uh, well. At the funeral, Michael's uncle and guardian, drunk Uncle Bob, says a few words as the T-Rex looks on from behind a tree. As everyone probably knows, Michael was orphaned when he was quite young, and it became my responsibility, my privilege, to raise him. But the truth of the matter is, everybody knows I'm just a drunk. Uncle Bob! <laughs> TNCC style. Which makes Tammy and Byron giggle uncontrollably, and the T-Rex... Dude, they show the T-Rex and the things nodding. No, no, this is the way he nods in agreement. Yeah, he's, he's useless. By the way, that's the eulogy I'll be delivering if I outlive any of you. <laughs> I love Cade, but the truth is I'm just a drunk. Me and Cody are over there. <laughs> no, <I'm> giggling. <laughs> the preacher... Oh, no. Then he says... Mikey, if you can hear me, I love you, boy. And that brings that to, that's when the gallons of sticky tears start flowing out of the T-Rex's face. This is where you can drop the emotional resonance bomb. So you know, this is where I can drop my favorite scene in the movie spot. So this is where I have to give kudos to what? Bobby, the dinosaur creator, that he decided to give his dinosaur creation tear ducks. It is a robot <laughs> that has tear ducts. Uh, uh. The preacher pushes drunk Uncle Bob aside forcibly, something drunk Uncle Bob's are probably used to, and ends the service, all under the watchful eyes of Dr. Walken Walkenstein? It's Walkenstein, but he prefers to be go by Walkenstein. 
And nobody down. noticed the big T-Rex that's just, you know, he's in, the that trees. Way. he's in the trees. And Helga wearing a very sexy body stock. Mm. Hey, Helga. Once everyone clears the area, Tammy jumps down into the gravesite. Hoity-toity Byron sure ain't going down there. And she opens up the coffin to retrieve Michael's beautiful body so they can put his brain back in it. But imagine this. His corpse is totally decomposed with rats gnawing away at it. So that's not going to work. Walkenstein and Helga pounce on them, but Tammy and Byron fend them off somehow, tossing them into the gravesite and running off with the T-Rex to find a more suitable host for Michael's beautiful brain. She, re she reassures him everything's going to be just fine as she gives the dinosaur smooches on the mouth. Dude, they haven't been on a date. And she's kissing this lizard's mouth. Yeah, but she's in love. High it's school all about love. High school girls. By the way, Doctor, if I intern with you, do you have like an associate like Helgen? Helga? Not at the moment, but I'm sure we can find one. You have in the past, though, Doctor. I, I'm. There's been. I, Every doctor should have a Helga. I mean, you got to find somebody like that that's going to not only assist you, but assist you. Light your cigarettes. Light your cigarettes during, uh, during surgery. As they said in uh, that stupid movie, Hot Bot, you can tell the boobies are real because they're so tactile. And I, I, lo I love Bernie. Bernie went for this role. He had fun with the role and just delivered. I, I enjoyed it a lot. He when does he that, he does that Forbes, I and mean, when he was as doc, the doctor in Friday Part Seven, he he. I, I haven't seen not, it. He he doesn't he doesn't uh, he he doesn't mail anything in. He gives it his all, man. He's a pro. I liked it. So Tammy and Byron load up the T Rex in the box truck that Doctor Walkenstein drove to the funeral, and they head over to the morgue to find a suitable host body for Michael's brain. None of the Stein. Walkenstein? No, Yakenstein. Let's just call him Dr. Kaiser. Is it just me or is Tut changing this fucker's name every time I say it? It's Wachenstein. 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 No, it's Wachenstein. No, it's Wachenstein. Whatever. Wachenstein. Like a player named Tut? Yeah, what's up? None of the bodies are ideal. They're either dead chicks, which she's like, I'm not into chicks. That doesn't interest me at all until 1998's Wild Things. <laughs> then Nev Campbell interested you very much. That, that's what you need to be Googling if you want to see some Denise Richards boobies. I forgot about that. And then when you said, check out Wild Things, it just all poured back in. I'm like, ooh, Nev Campbell. And apparently she had a fling with one of her real the real wives of Hollywood. She's on the, one of those real live Bravo shows now. And apparently she had an affair with one of those chicks. Wow. You're looking at the wrong guy to confirm that, but that is hot. It is hot doctor. Uh, I'll be right back. We should, we should, no, no, you think. On, <laughs> we should do a show on wild things. All hands on deck. We should do it, but only in quarantine. I got one of them. T-Rex hands on deck. Um, <laughs> no, here's T-Rex hands. So the bodies they're finding to potentially put Michael's brain in, they're either dead chicks, which at that time doesn't interest her, or old fat dudes, or some rando tiny dick white guys. Doctor, that's a band name. Rando tiny dick white guys. <sighs> Man, that they're just not going to hold a candle to Stacy Keach's ponytail. Mm -hmm. They finally decide that Michael should be the one who decides on his new body, so they start dragging corpses over to the window where he can give a T Rex thumbs up or a thumbs down if he likes them. <laughs> All set to a whimsical ragtime piano tune. This shit was funny. It was a funny it was. scene. Uh, well, Michael rejects them all. It makes sense. He's Paul Walker. He was a good looking kid. He's not going to be okay with you know he drags some like 50 year old asian corpse up there like what do you think 
But just then the cops show up, so they have to jump back in the box truck and take off. But not before Dr. Walkenstein and Helga escape from the truck's cab and run off. Buckflower and the other deputy take off in hot pursuit. Yak boy, did I use that term correctly? Hot pursuit. You did. So they radio in to Sheriff Black that your faggot son, I mean, sorry, your son, <laughs> Byron. That was the PG-13 version? That was this version. Oh. Sheriff, your fag son, oh, I mean, your, your son. <laughs> that, that, I mean, your son. <laughs> is evading us with the dinosaur. I'm sorry, but was this chasing through those orchards? With the dinosaur hanging out, of the, it was kind of cool looking. With that big ass dinosaur hanging out of the back of the truck, looking around while they were racing through the orchard, it was kind of a cool scene. Maybe not. I don't, I don't care. It was. Well, the box truck crashes into some trees, and while Tammy rides on the wounded T Rex's back to a nearby barn, that was a cool scene. Her riding on the back of the T Rex into the sunset. That was cinema, right? It was total Ray Harryhausen stop motion. It wasn't Spike Lee cinema, but it was cinema. <laughs> no, but dude, that I, I laughed out loud. because She's riding off into the sunset on the dinosaur. And it's complete stop motion, like Mighty Joe Young, King Kong shit. Yeah, they do a lot of stop motion. They did a lot of it earlier in the warehouse, too. But it, it all works in its own special way. Accent on special. Um... <laughs> Byron stays back to distract the, his father, the sheriff. He gets them to stop pursuing them. But dad isn't having any of this bullshit anymore. He orders his deputies to cuff his son and then when they, and orders them to move on to pursue the dinosaur. But when your top deputies buck flower, guess what? They lose the dinosaur. That's they lost <laughs> the sheriff. Sorry. Sorry, I'm drunk. You knew what you were getting when you hired me. Ineptitude. Yep. Yep. No argument here. There's no dinosaur out there. Oh, wait. It's a dinosaur. There's a dinosaur out there. <laughs> the next morning, the recently released from custody Byron puts on his bicycle shorts and pedals out to the barn to help his friends. He stops at the door barnway. Are you guys decent? He asks before entering. In all seriousness, how the hell would that work, Doctor? How would a T-Rex have sex with Denise Richards? Well, how would any of us have sex with Denise Richards? Uh, well, let me tell you. Uh, first, it would be some uh, wine. Pipe down. Some ch oh. uh, pipe down. Well, it would seem physiologically impossible, but Byron, being a homosexual, uh is probably unfamiliar with the dynamics as we're going to find out later. Denise is just in love with who Michael was, but yeah, the kid, you bring up a great point. I mean, it, 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 it yeah, it's not going to work. I was thinking doggy style. Doggy style. Oh, see, now that you bring that up, that, that way he's not really, yeah, if he's on top of her, that's not, I was thinking cowboy. She gets on top of him. Nice. Yeah, but he, with his are we going to say that with his tail and his little arms, like clearly we must with his little arms and his little fingers, maybe he has a little penis. I mean, we don't know. Oh, Yak Boy's got Yak Boy's got an idea here. Well, obviously, Bobby was smart enough to put tear ducts into his T Rex robot. Yeah, clearly, he must have put some sort of T Rex penis. He wanted to make it as realistic as possible. He didn't just make it a killing machine. He made it a loving machine. I would like everyone here to take a moment and appreciate the fact that you're all a part of something special. Because I guarantee you, nobody in the history of the world has ever taken this much time to dissect the physical dynamics and mechanics of the T-Rex making love to Denise Richards like we have. And I, and doctor, I think uh, the consensus is doggy style. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to. 
maybe reverse cowboy. <sighs> is it really know. doggy style or is it T-Rex style? It's T-Rex style. Everybody wants the dinosaur. Boom, boom, shaka la 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 boom, boom. I'm boom, your dinosaur boom. man. Everybody wants the dinosaur. Is that what is that what that song was about? Yes. It is now. I'll tell you, dad gum. This dad gum shit makes me smarter. You know what? Speaking of a dad gum IPA, yeah, boy. I did my due diligence. I drank those uh, outer darkness Russian imperial stouts. I did. Going, I'm going to shift to my other from the same brewery, Squatters Brewery in Utah. I'm going to shift to a my Mitt Romney IPA. I'm going to shift to a beer of theirs that I have had many times. It's one of my go-to beers. Your Bud Light. The, the Hop double. Rising Hop Double Rising. IPA. It is a wonderful beer. Tell us a little bit about it. It's an IPA. <laughs> Boom! Thank you, Yak Boy. Always on top of the beer knowledge. You don't get that kind of analysis anywhere else. It just reminded me of Major <laughs> League when you Bobby really here turns to the guy. He's, he's like, uh, Monty, anything to add? No. They don't call him the best color guy in the business for nothing, folks. You other weak-ass cigar podcast. Oh, Do you know who our ball. beer expert is? It, the Hop Rising, it's 9%. Uh, you're still right up, you know, not much further away from the Outer Darkness, which was 10 and a half. Uh, it comes in at about 72 IBUs. So once again, I mean, it's not like a tongue burner, but I mean, I've had it myself. It's really good. It is good. Um, it is an Imperial IPA, double IPA. Uh, and they, as uh, squatters themselves says, it's insanely smooth, dry hopped ale. I'd say with 9% ABV, somebody's going to be in the outer darkness pretty soon. <laughs> Somebody's doing the dinosaur. Somebody's doing the dinosaur. Boom, boom, shaka like a boom. Well, uh, it is, it's, a great, it's a great double IPA. And they also actually do a variation on this called the Texas Twist Hop Rising, which is yes. really more citrus and floral. Uh, it's, it's really, really good, too. But I, I wanted to... I had a feeling I want to follow up with something a little more simple. Wasn't that that fight that Bobby and or the Billy and Mike were at the beginning, the Texas twist? Uh, sort of. The testicular twist. The testicular <laughs> Texas twist. The ball twist. In Houston, we call that a Fort Worth shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Tammy and Michael are decent, and they're glad to see Byron. But unfortunately, the deputies and the sheriff follow them there. Why wouldn't they? So the barn is quickly surrounded by law enforcement. Byron and Tammy come out waving a white flag so law enforcement doesn't shoot. But it's not a white flag exactly as Buck Flowers tells us. That ain't a white flag. That's a goddamn brazier. <laughs> and what a brazier it is. God. Holy smokes. That thing is just... It's a it's a second place to Kinmon's Brazier at Halloween Four. It's it's a that it's a, is my favorite Brazier in film history. This might be my second one now. Yeah, but. it's a second to Kinmon's. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nice prop. Yeah, that thing is doing some serious work. Uh, Yax, would you say that Brazier was pendulous? It indeed was. Are you Doctor Jakenstein now? <laughs> I could be. I could be lots of things. <laughs> Again, I can't express how much I hate this whole video form. It's just it's terrible. But we're making the most of it. So. Uh, as Byron and Tammy plead for the police to hold their fire against the very agitated T-Rex, suddenly Dr. Walkenstein and Helga show up on the scene. It's that doctor and that lanky bitch of his again. <laughs> Dude, I miss Buck Flower. God, we don't have... That's the thing about movies nowadays. The 80s, the 90s, between Carpenter and all these filmmakers, they had these great character actors. That, I mean, 
Buck Flower. Like, if you're like, so who's the Buck Flower of the 2000s or the 2000 aughts? Nobody. There's nobody that's Buck Flower. There's nobody that's the the weasel, the roach guy. Like, we have no good character actors now. Everybody's just a hipster doofus, and they all kind of look the same. And it's just. Or, or they come, they come in and they have like little flash in the pan careers and then they don't do anything else. Like, a, I think McLovin from Superbad could have been close. He had a unique look, unique style, unique delivery, but he only did like three or four movies that I'm aware of and then just kind of gone. Uh, also, the uh, the skinny toothpick guy from uh, uh, Crap Road Trip. The Tom whatever movie DJ Qualls and those guys couldn't fucking hold a goddamn candle to the people. Oh, I'm not. I'm not saying they're as good as, but I mean they were like they could have been. But you no, know, you don't see it. Point, we, we, Kate. We were talking about how I watched Escape from New York, and then I decided to watch Escape from L.A., and we came up with our, our band name, Stacy Keach's Ponytail. But did Peter Jason, another Carpenter favorite, was in that movie? Uh, it was like, dude, th- these were dudes that were great actors. They they were bit players for the most part. They went out there and they kicked ass. I mean, and you just yeah. saw them over and over again, and they were so good. And it was like, I guess one, nobody's making movies at this. You're either making blockbusters where there's no roles for, of this type, or you're making micro budget movies where nobody's seen them and these actors might be doing things but you're not aware of them but i will say i I will take that's a whole nother discussion but i I will take this opportunity on our fifth anniversary show at the pub you guys tut made us take a moment because he was so impressed by a movie a new movie and we gave him the floor, Knives Out. Mm-hmm. And it turned out all you fuckers had seen it except me. And you guys all said very nice things about it. So, based on y'all's recommendation, guess Let me guess, you watched it and hated it. This asshole went and watched. I would never have watched it otherwise. But last week, in quarantine, I got, I'm running out of shit to watch. <laughs> Me and the missus watched Knives Out. And you know what? I really dug it. No! I dug it because it's the kind of Hollywood movie that they just don't make anymore. It's not a it's not based on a board game. It's not based on an existing IP, I guess they say. It's not it was just a a cleverly written original who done it. And you just don't get a lot of those with that kind of caliber of acting. Yeah. And Tut, you're right about Daniel Craig. Everybody stepped in there and did wonderful work. Uh, Plummer, to, Chris Evans. Just, just it, as it pains me to give Tut some... It was a fun flip. Yeah, it was. Uh, I would not have watched Knives Out if you guys hadn't talked so highly of it, and I I liked it a great deal. And Todd, I thought Daniel Craig did a very good job. I expect foul play. I say I say I say son. No, he no he went full foghorn more than you <laughs> let on. He went full foghorn a couple times, but I, whatever. It was, it was good. <laughs> it, was, it was really good. Yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis was great in it. Yes, she was. But like I think we mentioned on episode on the fifth, she played kind of what she does now, the matriarchal smart ass, uh, except for the Halloween film, which she does something totally different. She, she's great. I mean, she's one of my favorite actresses. I? But dude, he impressed me. Uh, Captain America impressed me. Um, the main chick who I don't know who she is. She she carried the thing well. Anna de Armas, who I believe is in the Blade Runner movie that I still have not seen yet. Yeah, I, I just... I, I'm kind of like you. I, I've kind of gotten to where 
I'm I'm thirsting for they don't have to be original concepts, but just not the stereotypical blockbuster, not the stereotypical comic book movie, not the remake. Oh, I mean, even if it is a remake, because I mean, we're old enough now. We've seen just about every damn thing. You're going to have themes that always pop up, but I'm just kind of just I like those self-contained themes to where just the actors deliver, the stories come, the oh, stories this, compact and delivers. This, I love it. This was just a tightly written script and just give it, give it to some good actors and let them go, let them do their thing. And it was, it was really good. So. And that's why I actually, I actually appreciate what we've done here recently is just, you know, finding these little gems that, you know, harken back to where a time when that was prevalent. I mean, I, I wouldn't have ever watched this film. And, you know, here we are. I'm sitting there watching this. I'm like, oh, God, here we go. Tammy and the T-Rex. I get two seconds into it. That theme song fires up, and I'm like, I'm in. Doctor, a port for every storm. Any port in the storm, brother. Any port in the storm. The world, the cinema world needs us as much as we need it. They may need us more. They need us more. They're turning out formulaic crap, and they need us more. We're here to right the storm. I like the thought of like some future generation, like a hundred generations from now, they come across an internet capsule, and the only thing then in it is TNCC episodes, and they're like, "This is American media. These guys. We need to bury a time capsule, boy." <laughs> Like students, these gentlemen were very well versed not only in cinema, but also in the mores and values of their times. However, we must note all four of them died at age 58 from liver cancer. Therefore, we must not condone their activities. Cody, Except what? the doctor who managed to man who managed to manufacture a metallic liver. The doctor's brain was implanted in a animatronic grizzly bear. Notice uh, Dr. Walkenstein. <laughs> Cody, could you make a note to look up mores later and tell me what that means? Is it values, Kate? Values. Well, as uh, Byron and Tammy plead for the police to hold their fire against the very edgy T-Rex, Oh, I already said all that. Okay. Oh, Walkenstein and Helga are there. They swear to police that the dinosaur is completely mechanical. They can control it. Tammy is crazy for saying it's Michael's brain in that thing. They don't know anything about that. So the sheriff gives them permission to shoot the T-Rex with a giant fucking tranquilizer gun, even though it's a machine. How can a tranquilizer do something with a machine? Well, it's a new type of tranquilizer. Exactly. Oh. This sounds this sounds like me. Doctor, how can that work? Uh this is some science you aren't privy to yet. It's some science, it's some science stuff. But in Dr. Walk Walkenstein's Wackenstein's? Dr. Wackoff? Dr. Wackoff's. I'm just gonna call him that. Hey, Tut's gone. I can call him whatever I want. It's Dr. Wack Dr. Wackoff's words, Eats. this technology that we're working on here will help put America back on top. Sound familiar? Yay, America, let's do something stupid and illogical. Well, the sheriff's like, yeah, let's do that. And, and this is gonna put America back on top. I'm not gonna stand in the way. So upon entering the barn, the T-Rex rips out the stomach of Dr. Wackoff, which prompts all the police to open fire, blasting the poor dinosaur, the poor mechanical dinosaur, to pieces. Tammy runs over to the crumpled body of the T-Rex, crying her eyes out for her seemingly dead boyfriend. Tut, did you need to put on a sweater? No. Oh. I had a production break. 
we cut to Tammy's house where she seems very chipper. Her parents are like, they're downstairs in their robes. I just worry about her. She has, she's had no grieving process, whatever. Just let her be. You know, Tammy's always been her own animal. As she kisses her stupid ass parents and races up to their bedroom. It's up there that we see that she's got a video camera rigged up to Michael's brain in a bubbling bowl of chemicals. And she tells him there might be some potential dead skiers up on a nearby mountain that they can transfer his brain into. Oh, that's cool. I love skiing. All of a sudden, he's talking in Paul Walker's voice. She hooked up a speaker. She can hear him talk to her. She pours a shot of bourbon over his brain and then does an awesome strip tease for him in her bedroom. Here we go. Here we go. She actually changes into some white panties and a bra and does a full strip tease for him. Here we go. All he right. Tells him, I can't wait to screw your brains out. This is what I've been waiting for the entire movie. Nobody th- wants a dinosaur. I thought in this last scene, Tut was going to get what he wanted. I thought she was going to rip off that fucking dog. It's a no. TNCC movie. It doesn't happen. So disappointing. I, much <laughs> like Tut, was hoping for the impossible. So two things here, boys. A, I'm like, what a loyal chick is Tammy to be doing all this for fucking brain in a salad bowl? That's unheard of, right? Like, she is giving him drinks and stripping for him, and it's just a brain in a bowl. And, like, that loyalty is unheard of these days, right? She's in love with his mind. I don't know. Part of this kind of thing, like harken back to like a man with two brains with Steve Martin. Yeah. I was just like, you know, I could enjoy that aspect of it. Like, cause I mean, it, it it's a little, you know, the, it, the more just the, the, the silly morbid aspect. Oh, there's, there might be some dead people up on the, on the mountain over here. We got to go look. Awesome. Like, I like being, even in death, he's like an airhead. Like, oh, cool. I like slit snow. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And B, I, I thought her loyalty was just outstanding. And B, and this might be wrong. Tell me if it's wrong. But after being quarantined for what seems like two years, but I think it's about two months, with two very young daughters, Every day, 24-7, I'm stuck here at home with, with these kids. Is it wrong that in this scene, I was jealous of that brainstem? Like, I thought, like, I'd ch- I'd, I'll take that life. Like, I, 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 I want to be that brain in that salad bowl. She pours bourbon over him. and She pours she's- whiskey on his head. And she does a strip tease in her little white panties. And it's Denise Richards, who, God almighty, she's one of those beautiful, sexy women uh, on the face of the earth. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with being jealous of that. I'm, I'm a, I wanted to be in that goddamn fishbowl. I'm a fully functioning human being, and I'm like, you know what? That brain really has it good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I think that brain has it great. I mean, if you're sitting there and you're getting whiskey poured on you and, and Denise Richards is str- dancing dude, around the room in her panties. But dude, here's where if I was that brain, I would be kind of like, he asked for another shot of whiskey to be poured over him. And she's like, no, no, you don't want to get and like, at that point, if I'm that brain, I'm like, oh, that's a red flag. Then he turns and fuck you, you bitch. Give me another fucking drink. Like, what the hell? He's a, he's a brain. Just give it to him. Everybody wants a dinosaur. Okay, the end. It's the end of our movie. Yay. Do you guys like it? I did. It was endearing. The lizard. Farming. Tut, the lizard people are keeping Walter Mondale's severed head alive in a punch bowl underneath an Arby's in Youngstown, Ohio. I've seen the video. They're preserving his brain to be the supreme leader of the newly formed world police force that will work unilaterally with NATO in 2025 to both confiscate our firearms and force feed every American man, woman, and child a four ounce serving of Michelle Obama's surgically removed ding dong. It's happening. The coronavirus is just a distraction, folks. 
Google it, Infowars.com, promo code TNCC20. I'd laugh, but it's true. According to legend, the entire movie was hastily thrown together because, get this, the lead producer was given access to a giant animatronic dinosaur <laughs> prop for <laughs> one week only before it was to be permanently relocated to amusement park. He had a week to shoot a movie with this dinosaur, and I totally believe that legend. But Let's having, do this. But having said that, what they threw together here is fun. It's a, a surprisingly comprehensible film, and what we saw, it makes sense. It, it, it's got an ABC timeline. I give it a big thumbs up. I, I really like this movie. I agree with you. I agree with you. It it act it all the parts actually work together. And that surprised me more than anything else because when I started it, I'm like, oh, this is just gonna be a shit show on rails. And it didn't, surprisingly. The story was ludicrous. But the actors were so dang great. Uh, and the dialogue was funny. I mean, it worked. It absolutely worked. I enjoyed the crap out of it. I think that's the one thing that saves it, Tut, is that the performers, all of them, uh, they all went for it. Um, you know, obviously, Denise is well, just a doctor, lady. Uh, Doctor, you've been on movie sets. That is a direct result of the director. He sets the tone. He's the one that lets them know shot after shot if they're, as a collective whole, the cast is on the same playing field. If Bobby, the computer nerd, is going too big and everyone else is playing straight, that's not going to work. If Dr. Walkenstein is going crazy big, and nobody else is going that big, that's not going to work. That's on the director to make sure everyone is on that same playful, big time, just over-exaggerated everything. And really, give props to the director because he got everyone to do that except Tammy. Tammy is the only one in this film who plays it straight and doesn't go big. And somehow the director knew if everyone else is going huge, but we have this central character that's playing it straight, Ties that, it all. that balance, that mathematical calculation is going to work at the end of this. It's a gamble. And again, we haven't seen the original cut of this movie. Maybe it's a total shit. Show. <laughs> it was. But for this cut, the way he balanced that, director actor relationship with everybody because dude denise richards went as big as walkenstein and bobby and everybody else that wouldn't work she plays it kind of to yeah the and i i always give directors where i i can see it i can see him having to direct these people differently than than her and you know, I think we saw glimpses of that in Mannequin 2 on the move. But, but I think he really <laughs> I think he really nailed it here. I don't know if we saw any glimpses of it in Mannequin 3, Drink My Pee Pee, but uh, the... Uh, Again, a long lost film. Uh, yeah, I mean, the performances sell this for me. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got to judge one movie against its own movies in their genre and you know this this is obviously a, a thing that set out to be what it was i think it it, it was successful and that it, it achieved what it was supposed to be and obviously they didn't saturday know. night movie and <coughs> excuse me I, I think obviously they went to this thing not knowing what it was I it mean, was a silly saturday night movie that's what's supposed the to guy, be the guy totally shot two different movies in a handful of weeks, and we don't know if the PG version worked, but this one certainly worked as a as a kind of grand guillot, over the top, just splatter thon. I thought it worked great for what this is. I I love that 
you take, you know, Terry Kaiser, John Franklin, you know, obviously, you know, Paul Walker is about 20 years old. He's just happy to get a paycheck. He's hoping this turns into a career, which it did for him, a lucrative one. Same with Denise Richards, but Kaiser, Buck Flower, you know, these guys are, they're working actors. They're the definition of working actors. They're picking up a check, but they're not just, you know, give me my money and I'll walk through it. They're going to go out there and give you everything they got as performers. Uh, the sexy Helga. I mean, she was fun. She was dancing around. She was doing, you know, she had energy to what she was doing. She was a sexy woman, but she was, she had energy, what she was doing. Uh, they went out there and they gave it everything they had. And that really, that and the, the, the dinosaur fingers, because I just thought when he's punching the telephone numbers and that kind of stuff was really just very, very funny for me. That's when I laughed out loud, but they, they give it their all. And, uh, you know, I think that turns what, what could have been an extremely forgettable movie into something that, that had some heart uh, and, and was entertaining. I'm glad we watched it. I'm glad I saw it, and I give it a big uh, thumbs up. I give the Squatters Imperial Stout a thumb sideways. And before I turn it over to the rest of you, I will give the cigar a giant thumbs up. I love the Lizard King. Yak Boy, you next. Film, beer, cigar. Lizard King. Absolutely. Loved it. I will have another one as soon as I can. Uh, the Dogfish Head, The Perfect Disguise is a fantastic beer for a double IPA, as they claim. It has, it, it's, it's not a kick in the teeth. But it still is really good. It's mellow, like I said. It's the, the the name they gave it. It's light in appearance, but it tastes great from the the, the IPA perspective. Okay. So in the movie, thumbs up. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm like I said, you know what what you had said. I mean, it just. They had fun with it. I mean, you know, it's a, it's, it's so rare that you see, even with some of these films, because it, it, even though they, you know, were basing it off of the fact that they had access to a animatronic T Rex, they some, you know, put together this film and it works. They have characters memorable characters even if they are only on the screen for a short amount of time yeah. that's what i really liked about it i mean you know like you take buck flowers and the other guy that that you know the the neville and the norville you don't forget them you're like they have this chemistry between the two characters you can sit there and say when they show up those two guys as cops have been working together for years <laughs> yeah. and that and that's really great screenwriting and directing like hey we got this dinosaur do something with it okay we'll cook together a script and we'll get some really great actors and we'll really play to their strengths to where everyone just shines it's great doctor your beer and your movie uh the dad gum ipa from rar and sons a uh, very enjoyable beer um this is going to sound strange because it's not going to sound complimentary, but it is. Uh, there wasn't anything extremely remarkable about that beer in a very forceful way. Uh, but I very much enjoyed it. It, it. it seemed like I know there's a lot of IPAs out there. Um, it didn't hit you over the head with bitterness. Um the fruitiness that was described in the can would be a negative for me. I didn't get that from it. It was a very enjoyable beer. I really enjoyed it. Went down easy. Really liked it. Can't recommend enough the Rar and Sons Dad Come IPA. 
Uh, I'd recommend everybody try it out and and uh, let me know what you think. Um, didn't get to partake of the cigar movie. It's like I said, man. It, it's a it's a class B movie, obviously. Um, but the actors went for it. Uh, it had a good production value. Obviously, there was some stop motion stuff they're going to have to do. Uh, I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed the energy from everybody. Um, obviously, Denise Richards and Paul Walker went on to bigger and better things, but uh, they they were they were trying their hardest. I mean, they they really were. And and all the other supporting actors, Buck Flower, Terry Kaiser, John Franklin. The chick that played Helga, they were all, they all went at it. Everybody, Billy, the parents, they all, they all gave it everything they had. Nobody was walking through this. And that made for a very enjoyable, fun little romp. I agree, doctor. And I will disagree that they went on to bigger and better things. Maybe bigger things, but I don't know if I saw Paul Walker or Denise Richards in anything better than this. So that, that, that was probably euphemistic on my part what i meant I, uh you're right bigger things that the two of them made a lot of money and had long long careers and made a lot of money uh, I, I enjoyed paul walker and denise richards better in this than anything they went on to do after that tut cigar beer movie let's check out wild things again before we make that before we make a definitive statement on that i think we're all gonna watch that again. <laughs> yes we are uh lizard king absolutely great loved the thing uh death what is this called death before disco porter uh big fan of that and the movie i give it two t-rex arms up tell us a dallas cowboys fan i always said terrell owens had alligator arms now we know it was t-rex arms t-rex arms that could do everything we hit a home run tonight, boys. Uh, I think so, asshole. Wait, wait, why is your name asshole now? What is this? Tom, oh, is that what you're doing? Is my name to asshole. I, I like, like Yakasaurus Rex. Cade, I thought you were doing that. I'm going to apologize to you. I thought you were doing Cade X. And he Fred is. Cade. Yep. Turns out it's a player named Tut doing that shit. What I have I been under all night? This is saying cock sucking dog for the last three hours. No, but if I could change your name now, I would. Dude, that's Tut that's been changing my. I, I, I told not. you that hasn't been me. It's not. That's not me. I have not been doing that. What does it say? My name is now. Mm-hmm. Tut's bitch. Oh. It's not me. You know what, Cade? When Why it comes would I to- do that? Why would I say? Cade. Cade. When it comes to presidents, that Andy Jackson was a son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. <laughs> that's just, that's not, that's not a Yakasaurus, we got Yakasaurus Rex. Unbelievable. Tut, as your bitch, would you please give us some links? All right, first of all, if you're going to do a lot of uh, home shopping from Amazon, we know you are. You're in quarantine. You got nothing else to do. You need to shop. Go to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club website, scroll over to the Amazon banner, click on that, do your shopping from there. It helps us to keep some uh, bills paid. If you're going to uh, search for your lovely cigars that you hear about or want to experiment with, go to Tuesday Night Cigar Club, click on the Famous Smoke Shop banner, do your shopping from there. If you spend $100 or more, enter our promo code TNCC20 and you get $20 off that order that's like 20 percent that stills out there and then uh, join us on uh, facebook tuesday night cigar club subscribe to us which many of you have and we definitely appreciate it uh subscribe to us on youtube tuesday night cigar club follow us on instagram tncc underscore podcast and uh follow us on twitter at tncc cast is that it that's it and I did not change your name to the bone now. You're now TNCC Big Dick Bastard. Well, I guess Tuttle felt bad about the things he wrote up <laughs> earlier. Change that. It's in there. There's video of me. I've got a giant penis. Google it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, like I said, we're, God damn it, we're trying our best to keep bringing you the show. 
while you're stuck in your homes and your uh, wherever the hell you are, um, this has been an exercise in patience and um, trying to get it right. And I think maybe tonight we got it right. This felt good. So thanks everybody for tuning in. We will be here. Uh, I'm raising my hand. Yeah, stop. Uh, I just want to say that uh, we got a shout out from a lovely young fan uh, named Stephanie. So mm -hmm. just want to say thank you to Stephanie for uh, think, being uh, here. Yeah, I see you guys. We got a really nice uh, compliment on YouTube, uh, one of our most popular episodes. And uh, yeah, keep them coming. We thrive off your. Uh, look at Ty, he's invigorated. Uh, Stephanie Tut's not single, but I am. Sorry, Kate. Yax is Homer Simpson himself into the wall. He just wants out of here. And we should probably get out of here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we were going to do this again. In two weeks, we'll do another movie, another beer, another cigar. That's what we do. And in the meantime, we hope you stay safe, healthy, practice, uh, just take care of each other. That's fair to say. Um, just because you're not vulnerable or struggling as me, you have to be an asshole and put other people in danger. So try to be cool to other people. Um, I don't know, maybe not show up in mass crowds with guns and shouting at people. It might not be the right thing to do. We're not political here, so I'm not going to go there. Um, I know they're all very good people. Um, but they might be assholes. We're not assholes, though. We stay safe in our four corners of Central Texas. And we will be back here for another show for you soon. So, may the wings of liberty never lose a feather. As you do what you're told, and you do it because you care, T-Rex style. May the wings of liberty never lose a feather. Thanks for supporting us. We appreciate you. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Sign our motherfuckers. Fuck you. We'll see you next time. Piss off. We love you. A little harsh, but. Uh... <laughs>I thought we might actually get to hear about Denise Richards doing it with a dinosaur on this show. What a bummer. Thanks for nothing, you drunken assholes. Well, anywho, to learn more about the cigars enjoyed on tonight's episode, you can visit ovejanegracigars.com. For more on O'Brien's Irish Pub, the live music leader in Central Texas, please visit O'Brien'sTemple.com and download their free smartphone app, where you'll find full beer listings including over 40 on tap, menu information, and a calendar of upcoming live events. To listen and purchase music heard on tonight's program, check out www.fritzbeermusic.com. Thank you for listening to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club podcast. This is Keith A. Howell saying until next time, friends, unless we see you sooner at the pub. So keep it smoky, and for God's sake, keep it ballsy as well.